unwanted people begging for the entry into somebody else's house. All right, we're back with you inside of the Africa Forum. This is Running Africa. And just checking out the, whoops, the newspapers in Venezuela. Uh, some of the newspapers in Venezuela, so where am I now? Ultimas Noticias. And Presidente Maduro, Voto Ilamo, Expressa. All right, so President, uh, President, um, Maduro has uh, voted and, uh, I better translate this. <laughs> All right, so give it to me in anglais. So let me go here. All right, so basically what they're saying here, and I'm not able to get the, the English translation. I'm not sure why. So let me go English, Spanish again. Uh, so basically, all right, so what it says, oh, good, so I was right. President Maduro has voted and he has called uh, to express a will in national unity. He, starting today, he says, let me quote, Starting today, we are going to come out stronger as a country to speak clearly and powerfully. The voice of Venezuela will be one. And the head of, said the head of state when exercising his right to vote today in vote early, man. What time is it in Venezuela now? All right. So there's a picture of him voting. That's pretty early. This is Sunday, December three. Yeah. I'm looking at the right thing. Also, it says here, everything ready for the consultative re- referendum. Consultative uh, referendum. Let me go here and see what that is saying. So it's all in Spanish, and everything's ready for the consultative uh, referendum. Fifteen thousand eight hundred and fifty-seven voting centers, twenty-eight thousand and twenty-seven tables enabled in the three hundred and thirty-five municipalities of the twenty-four entities in the country. The people of Venezuela will be writing another page, according to. Ultimas uh, Noticias. The people of Venezuela will be writing another page in their history, one in which territorial integrity and sovereignty are once again defended more than 200 years after the independence feat in the 21st century. A new milestone, the paper says, will be established in a battle in which a weapon as formidable as it is powerful will be used. It is a consultative referendum whose power lies in the fact that from it emerges, from it emerges the voice of the people, which is the voice of God. In Venezuela, this is what they're saying. The voice of the people is the voice of of God, and you know that's what Vox Populi mean. <laughs> the voice of the people, Vox Dio. All right, so the voice of the people, which is the voice of God, um, that is what is coming out of Venezuela today in this referendum. They say today it is more relevant than ever this time in the defense of Guyana Esequiba. So they say uh, Guyana, Guyana they say in Venezuela, Guyana Esequiba. A territory that by right and history, according to this report from Venezuela, corresponds to Venezuela. And this is what Nicolas Maduro is saying. The Vice President of the Republic, uh, Delcy Rodriguez, recently assured that there is nothing to discuss here about the historical titles, about the legitimate rights of Venezuela over the Esequibo. It is incontrovertible Venezuela's rights over that territory. He added that Venezuela was born with that territory, that no one gave it away, that no one gave it up, but there was a robbery. There was a dispossession of our territory. And that is precisely what the Venezuelan people who have been immersed in this constitution pro- consultation process, speaking to us, listening to us, are going to express this morning. Despite Guyana's unusual efforts to stop the holding of the referendum before the International Court of Justice, Venezuela Vice President says, nothing will prevent Venezuelans from voting this morning in defense of our Esequibo. Nothing is going to stop it. All right, so we're going to be focusing on this situation that's unfolding in Guyana, this this border between Guyana and Venezuela. 
one of the most important things to know is that we're talking about 70% of Guyana, 70% of Guyana. Um, so we're going to be looking at the historical context, talking about um, the Schomburg line, because that is relevant. We're going to be talking also about that arbitration, which we have been talking about for the last two weeks. And uh, the Western media talking about uh, really focusing on this renewed tension. When you go to the newspapers in Venezuela, they are excited. They're using reggaeton, not reggae music, but out of reggae, which came reggaeton. So they're using reggaeton. And they're using all kinds of music appealing to the youth. We're seeing that kind of music coming also, not necessarily reggaeton, but all kinds of music coming out of um, Guyana as Guyana um, defends uh, its territory. So we're talking about 70%. What I want you to do for me this morning again is to Google Guyana and Venezuela on the map. Just say Guyana and Venezuela on the map. And um, look at what I want you to be aware um, of what we're talking about. Have an idea of that area we're talking about and uh, the amount of territory, the vast swathe of land that um, is under contention. This is this is this is <laughs> that's why Guyana says it's an existential threat. It is an existen- existential threat. Um, so you have the Atlantic, or if you're coming, let me see how you're coming. If you're coming from WE, if you come from West, so you have the Pacific Ocean, then you have Panama going down Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and um, all right. So next you have Venezuela. Below Venezuela, there's Brazil. So Brazil, Venezuela is sharing a border with Colombia, with Brazil, with Guyana. And uh, then you have the Atlantic Ocean on the other side there. And then that, so when you look at Guyana, because Guyana, what Venezuela wants, the land that is under contention, the disputed um, border territory, which was drawn by international arbitration in 1899, the Essequibo territory, um, that region, it accounts for two-thirds of Guyana. Two-thirds. Two-thirds. Most maps will show you the disputed region that Venezuela is claiming. So we're going to be doing a few things this morning, putting this in historical context, looking at what's happening there in Venezuela today, talking about what all of this means uh, for for a lot of the program this morning. Look at Looking at the five questions that are being raised in the referendum this morning, Venezuelans are asked to vote in this referendum on five questions. By the way, Venezuela had a practice vote. <laughs> this is how serious Maduro. Maduro, we're going to talk about Maduro too, right? So they actually had a practice election, a, pra- a practice referendum, a practice vote where people went out to vote, right, on the, on, the, on the five questions one day last week. And believe me, there were lines and lines and lines. I watched that thing all day that people kept coming and coming and coming and coming. The people of Venezuela are excited about this referendum. That is the part of the conversation that we are not necessarily getting on this side of the world. You understand? So, it, so there are always three sides to a story and sometimes 15 if you're a journalist. And so we're looking at all of them. Now, you know where I stand. I stand with, uh, with Guyana. I understand that though that it's a complex complicated, multifaceted, multidimensional issue. This is not a linear situation where you can go Schomburg, Geneva Agreement, um, uh, uh, um, Arbitration 1899. You can't just draw lines like that because this has so much packed into it that we have not yet discussed. We want to talk about the historical context. I understand that there are some Pan-Africans a lot of people in the Pan-African community are literally on the fence on this, you know. Yes, and especially the original Pan-Africanists who are coming from the days when Pan-Africanism and socialism and communism was wearing the same clothes or were wearing the same jacket, <laughs> bush jacket. And I, and, and, and I don't mean this, you know, flippantly. I'm, I'm, I'm talking serious Pan-Africans. Who, are, who have been identifying 
as Pan-Africans, understanding what it means long, long, long before them time. Some who were in the conference in Manchester, some who were um, at the conference in Durban. You understand what I'm saying? A lot of uh, Pan-Africans are on the fence in this. And in the same breath, there are a lot of Pan-Africans who are siding with Venezuela on this because sometimes you have to take a stand even if you're sitting down. So a lot of Pan-Africans are also siding with Venezuela on this. I do understand that too. I understand the fence. I understand why um, why some Pan-Africans have taken the Venezuela um, perspective on this and, and taken Venezuela's side on this. And I also understand why there are other Pan-Africans who have taken Guyana's side. Now, I am one of those Pan-Africans who have taken Guyana's side. I know that I had to have a conversation with myself about post-colonialism, about my own ideology, about who I was, about what I stood for, um, while I was taking Guyana's side, I had, I had that conversation. And, uh, up to this morning, we still have a conversation because, it, you know, it really is a, is, it's, it, for us, it's a difficult place to be. Uh, for some people, it's a knee-jerk reaction. You take Guyana's side. Guyana is the only, uh, English-speaking, um, country in, in, in South America. And, um, also, um, you know, there are historical ties, but these are also colonial ties, you know. So that's another thing. So when you go into looking um, through the post-colonial lens, we're talking about post-colonial thoughts now, where do you really stand and who are you really? And, you know, if you go Guyana side, what it is that, what do you, who are you <laughs> on everything else? That question has to be answered for students of post-colonial thought i'm just saying i'm just saying that question has to be answered it is a hard one to answer and this morning i found myself asking it all over again as to where do i really stand but i um you know then i had to go yes you know uh, as, as a taino <laughs> so this is where i stand as a taino you know um and then, even as a Taino, uh, indigenous peoples here in Jamaica, we're standing with the indigenous people of, uh, of Guyana and the indigenous people of the Essequibo region. This is a region that is under, under contention. The, this region is occupied by what? How many people live there? It's about 120 something thousand. Guyana is a population of 800,000. So that about 120 something thousand. Um, but these are indigenous people, you know. These are indigenous people. Um, so that's a whole other con- consideration. So all of this, they're doing something about us without us, is I suppose, is what these indigenous people might be saying. But we're going to go deeply, we're going to be diving deep in this situation this morning. And I have some of my, my friends, uh, to help me through this, uh, scholars themselves. So Dr. Godfrey Vincent, uh, who is, Professor, uh, will be helping me with this. He is no stranger. Uh, author, professor, historian. Uh, he belongs to the Georgia Association of Historians, Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And I'm seeing once again the wrong university for him because he was at Tuskegee, but he has left Tuskegee. And I'll tell you, um, where, where he is now. All right. So he, Member of the editorial board of the Journal of Labor and Society, member of Paul Grave Encyclopedia Editorial Advisory Board. He is published in the Journal of Labor and Society, International Encyclopedia of Revolution and Protest, International Labor and Working Class History, and the Paul Grave Encyclopedia of Imperialism and Anti-Imperialism. He has um, just published his book, uh, Rebels at the Gates, The Oil Field Workers Trade Union, OWTU in the era of George Weeks, 1962 to 1987. And he's also the co-founder of the Southern uh, Continent Center for Research and Policy. Research interests, his research interests include labor history with a focus on new forms of labor organizations and working class struggles, African diaspora history, Caribbean history, 20th century American history, Development studies that focuses on international development, issues in international development and the history of development in the global south. 
international political economy. So he's going to be coming on this morning to put all of this in a historical context for us. And then uh, my brother David Mohammed is uh, in England today, but we are going to be talking with him also on this issue. And uh, yeah, David Mohammed, of course, is uh, a lecturer, sociologist, writer, radio and TV presenter. He is a director and founder of the Black Agenda Project and the Kwame Tourist Center. He's the Eastern Caribbean representative of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, no stranger to Jamaica. He holds a sociology uh, PhD and a double major bachelor degree from the University of the West Indies in sociology and education. He is the author of Black Studies and Black Youth at Risk and... Um, Launched the George Padmore Boys Academy in 2022, teaching discipline, conflict resolution, and life skills to young males 17 years and under. He owns and operates the online radio station Black Agenda Project Radio and is featured from time to time in many or uh, Caribbean media. You would have heard him many times here on IREA FM. Uh, we're going to be talking to him this morning. It is also no joke that he holds a second degree black belt in jiu-jitsu karate. <laughs> we have to get that in there. <laughs> My brother David Mohammed, um, he was a VIP bodyguard who has worked with um, Winnie Mandela. He's a qualified VIP bodyguard. He's um, guarded Winnie Mandela in 1998. Uh, so we're talking about a brother who has done so much in the struggle of both brothers. We... I hope to go um, as an aside. So th- this is our focus on Guyana, Venezuela. And then later on in the program, we're going to go live to Kenya, where Dr. Professor Tunde Biwaji is. Uh, we'll be linking with him live in Kenya. Also, we're going live to Tanzania, where our brother Jerry Small uh, remains in Tanzania. So quite a few to get through this morning. So we're going to put this in historical perspective. We're going to be looking at the different treaties and uh uh, arbiters and arbitrations and um, lines and uh, and so on, agreements and all of that. Also looking at the international involvement and the implications of the referendum that is underway today uh, in Gaya, in uh, in Venezuela. They're voting on five questions. So when I come back from the break, uh, I will um, pick up on those questions. In the meantime, though. You're inside of the Africa Forum. This is uh, Running Africa. And by the way, last Sunday at the 80th annual conference of the JLP, the Jamaica Labour Party conference, did you watch that? Did you see that? All right, so I watched it. I watched um, all of it. I, it's, and it. Is it me or was it pretty short? I don't know. I, I, especially the, the Prime Minister's speech. I expected him to speak a little longer, but it was pretty short. And it was also underwhelming. Um, I've said many things in this space about the um, different politicians talking and, and and I've been very fair, I think, on what I think about their delivery. Um, I'm not quite sure, but, but the Prime Minister seemed to have been a little bit off on Sunday and it could have been that he was very tired. He probably needs to get some rest, I don't know. Um, but he was a little bit off, not his usual self, it appeared to me. And he had moments of... Uh, brain freeze. I don't know if you saw that through the speech. Well, if you think I lie, me, I tell go watch it again. I sat down and I watched all of it. There was moments when he just went blank. He had moments of, one of those moments, actually, it was very profound because um, he was talking about crime. He said, let's go to security now. And then he started talking about crime. And he said, Jamaica has, well, he said a few things and he said, Jamaica has the lowest rate of incarceration in the region. He had to be going somewhere with that because that would be a bad reflection on Jamaica um, in context, in the context of what he was talking about. So he said that and the entire room fell silent. There was a deafening bolt of silence there and probably disbelief too. Um, But it, it was a response to the blatant truth. And he said that and, you know, he had one hand extended... And he stopped and looked and then he just moved on to something else. And he stopped for a minute and it, it, it was a moment, you know, it was a very, very weird moment in the speech. But <laughs> it could be that, you know, 
Sometimes the brain leaks through the mouth. I don't know. But so I don't know what you thought of the conference, but it was underwhelming. Also, I think many people in the place were disappointed. Um, you could see when they were filing out that there was some level of disappointment because I think some people wanted um, something to leave with. For example, they probably want an election date to kind of get them all riled up. But there was no riling up. Uh, the Prime Minister said at the beginning that I'm talking to you here and I'm talking also to those who are watching. Obviously, the, the diplomatic community is there. He's a Prime Minister still and so on and so forth. So I'm not quite sure what happened there, but it just wasn't the kind of oomph kind of thing um, that you would expect uh, at the 80th anniversary. Also, for an 80th anniversary conference, it was really very lackluster. And, um, wow. So we're watching to see um, what happens with the local government election. There's a whole lot of upheaval in politics, in Jamaican tribal politics. Um, you know, anyway, just my two cents, my two pence worth on what I saw at the conference. The main thing that I wanted to get out is that, you know, that his old speech on crime and violence. I think we need to go back and look at that, announcing that again, because he's been saying this in many different places or in a few places at least, that um, he wants to um, have another, name another ministry, create another ministry to deal with crime and violence. That, you know, that, that's a whole lot of tripe, you know. Um, you know, you split, you have Ministry of Security, Minister of Justice, Ministry of um, Constitutional Reform, this is getting out of hand. This is, this is like, this is, this is what people do when they are not able to, to, to manage properly. That you create 15 different areas of management and split it up again into 15 different more. So basically what, what he's saying to us is that we're not managing around here. So we're going to splinter everything and double up on some things uh, as we have been doing. You know, you, 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 you name a, a ministry. What happens? When, all right, so you name a, a ministry that's going to deal specifically with crime and violence. That is foolishness, but you name a ministry that's going to specifically with that. Why is it foolishness? Because you already have the Ministry of National Security and Justice. So what is that for? You split that in a two and you, you, you split that first of all, and then you split it again and have a constitutional reform ministry or constitutional affairs uh, ministry. And you have an economic growth and job creation over the other side, so that's a whole other story. But, um, so, so what happens now? Because your intention is to bring down crime. So when you bring down crime, now what do you do with the ministry? Disband it? Well, hopefully. Um, but anyway, nobody, uh, I, he should be challenged on this. There are 50 other ways to deal with crime and violence that you have not touched yet. And the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation can start by addressing structural violence in Jamaica. Also, we heard him saying that they're about now to bring all the agencies that deal with, um, uh, uh, you know, um, issues to deal with children and so on. All the agencies are going to be coming. They've been talking about this since 19 how when. Do you know how many programs I've done on this? I've had every single agency member come in this studio since 1998 at least saying the very same thing it's not centralized and to deal with the issue we have to centralize it and how we centralize it and that kind of foolishness and we will not it's not foolishness it's a, it's a great idea but you've been saying this from 1998 on my watch and i'm sure you're probably saying it before that on other people watch so so there was that there was also um <laughs> um uh, climate change. Hmm. We told you this two years ago. We told you this during COVID, remember? That Jamaica was had already doing a lot of things behind the scenes. I don't know if you remember that, that, um, those programs that we did. Yeah, man. And, and that this is going to be the focus of the Andrew Holness led administration because they already had signed off on many things. We gave you the websites. We showed you what they were doing and what was said and who was saying it and so on. But there were no announcements. There were no public announcements. And later on, we saw one little teeny announcement on GIS. But this is all about money. This is 
all about money. Right now, they're in Saudi Arabia, in, in, in Dubai, with them, with them begging bowls. How shameful. This is a situation that's going on now in Dubai. They're there with their begging bowls. This is, this is a crisis. But anyway, so it's this climate thing that you see, Jamaica, it is now an agenda, an agenda, an agenda item on, uh, for the government, you know, it all has to do with money. All right. I'm going to take a quick break and go to my first, uh, interview and come back, I think, later on in the program to pick up on some of these issues and some of what, what we heard coming out of that conference. Burger King with the best tasting burger under the sun. The time by Burger King is now two minutes after seven o'clock. And I want to go to the phone lines now to speak to my, my very special guest and... Uh, let me see if Dr. Godfrey Vincent is online. Dr. Vincent? Yes, I'm here. Good ah, morning. Greetings, greetings, Dr. Vincent. How are you? I'm fine. All right, so we already did our, our, our introduction to you. And uh, thank you so much because I know you have been traveling these last few days. So I know that the jet lag must still be there. So thank you for the early morning get up to help us to have this conversation about um, the put the the, the Guyana uh, Venezuela uh, Esequibo border dispute in context historical context. So thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, so so Dr. Vincent, let, let me start here because obviously the the referendum is ongoing today. Everybody's talking about the referendum this morning. It makes sense to say uh, what is happening, but also why we have this situation ongoing. So, um, help us to understand, how did we get here? What are the origins of uh, this dispute uh, between Guyana and uh, Venezuela? Okay, so I, I have a document here um, the, called the Venezuela Boundary Dispute 1895 to 1899. So I just read, if it, if it Okay with you to read it? Yes, please. The Venezuelan boundary dispute officially began in 1841 when the Venezuelan government protested alleged British encroachment on Venezuelan territory. In 1814, Great Britain had acquired British Ghana, North Ghana, by treaty with the Netherlands. Because the treaty did not define a western boundary, the British Commission commissioned Robert Schomburch, a surveyor and, and naturalist, to delineate that boundary. His 1835 survey resulted in what came to be known as the Schomburg Line, a boundary that effectively claimed an additional 30,000 square miles of Ghana, for Ghana. In 1841, Venezuela disputed the British delineation, claiming territorial delineations established at the time of their independence from Spain. Venezuela claimed its borders extended as far east as the Esequibo River, an, e an effective claim on two-thirds of British Ghana's territory. When gold was discovered in the disputed territory, Great Britain sought to further extend its reach claiming an additional 33,000 square miles west of the Schomburg Line, an area where gold had been discovered. In 1876, Venezuela protested, broke diplomatic relations with Great Britain, and appealed to the United States for assistance, citing the Monroe Doctrine as the justification for U.S. involvement. For the next 19 years, Venezuela repeatedly 
petition for U.S. assistance, calling on its neighbor to the north to intervene by e- by either sponsoring arbitration or intervening with force. The United States responded by expressing concern, but did little to facilitate a resolution. In 1895, invoking the Monroe Doctrine, newly appointed U.S. Secretary of State Richard Onley sent a strongly worded note to British Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary Lord Salisbury, demanding that the British submit the Bongri dispute to arbitration. Salisbury's response was that the Monroe Doctrine had no validity as international law. The United States found that response unacceptable, and in December 1895, President Grover Cleveland asked Congress for authorization to appoint a boundary commission, proposing that the commission's findings be enforced, quote, by every means, end of quote. Congress passed the measure unanimously, and talk of war with Great Britain began to circulate in U.S. press. Great Britain, under pressure in South Africa with the Boers and managing an empire that spanned the globe, could ill afford another conflict. Lord Lord Salisbury's government submitted the dispute to the American Boundary Commission and said nothing else of the Monroe Doctrine. Venezuela enthusiastically submitted to arbitration, certain that the commission would decide in its favor. However, when the commission finally rendered a decision on October 3, 1899, it directed that the border follow the Schomburg line. Although of rejection of Great Britain, increasingly extravagant claims, the ruling preserved the 1835 demarcation. Disappointed, the Venezuelans quietly ratified the commission's finding. Of far great significance, the Anglo-Venezuelan boundary dispute incident asserted for the first time a more outward-looking American foreign policy particularly in the Western Hemisphere. Internationally, the incident marked the United States as a world power and gave notice that under the Monroe Doctrine, it could exercise its claim prerogatives in the Western Hemisphere. Mm-hmm. End of quote, U.S. Department Archives. Mm-hmm. So this document here gives us some historical context yes. as to the situation Right. Ongoing situation between whole, Venezuela whole, and Ghana. Thank you so much. Online, Dr. Godfrey Vincent, we're talking about the Guyana-Venezuela border dispute. Uh, within the context that today, uh, there is a consultative referendum that's underway in Venezuela. There are five questions on the um, referendum. Guyana has um, brought this to the uh, International Court of Justice. They ruled on it on Friday. Uh, well, uh, we, we'll come to that ruling in a little while. In the meantime, though, there's a historical context to what is unfolding in uh, um, Guyana, at the border between Guyana and Venezuela, that Esequibo region. There is a historical context to that. Dr. Jeff, uh, Vince, Godfrey Vincent is helping us to understand this. And you just read, Dr. Vincent, from a document out from the which archives? The U.S. archives, the United States archives. This is documented. It is archived. That is, this is the, this is the original agreement. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, it's... that from the dispute officially began in 1841. Remember that the, the Britain bought Ghana from the, the, that whole region, right? What they call the Ghana it was owned by the Dutch. Mm-hmm. And the, and and Britain bought bought. Got that part of the Guyanas from the Dutch in and in 1841. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, yes, go ahead. So, the, the, with a treaty with, with the Netherlands, <laughs> so oh, what, we, what we'll have to find out is whether or not to what extent the Netherlands, when they had owned that part of the world, had encroached on lands of Venezuela. Right. So, so when, what, when, what, what, what when, we're finding when, when British, when British, what we're finding before you go British, on to the British, um, 
signed the treaty. Yes. The treaty did not define the Western boundary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, the British commissioned commission this, this British naturalist to draw a boundary. That's Robert Schomburg. Right, Robert Schomburg. And in 1835, the survey resulted in what known as the Schomburg Line that effectively claimed an additional 20,000 square miles for Ghana. Mm -hmm. So it means, if that is if based on what is, is documented here, that the British had encroached on Venezuela's land. Yeah. What, what, what is not in that document is what it's before 1841 um, with the Treaty of Munster and the 1648 treaty between the Dutch and the Spanish, which established the Essequibo River as a boundary between the two respective territories, uh, which would also speak in favor of, of Venezuela's claim. But, but, but they had said then that there was imprecise language there in that treaty and uh, ambiguity. So, so, uh, uh, and here we're talking about land that belonged to the, uh, if you're going to use the word belong, that the people who were here first were the indigenous people, right, Dr. Vincent? Uh, so yes, we're talking about course, the, 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 the Western world, <coughs> through colonization, the, the Dutch, the British, they, they took, the, the Dutch and the Ghanas took the lands away from the indigenous peoples. <coughs> Right, and and here we are. So the it? land was not there in the first place. And here and we are. This, this is the problem we are facing in the world. Yes, Sister Kabu, yes. is that all the, the problems in Ghana? What is happening between Ghana and Venezuela? That is because uh, because of, the, of 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 colonialism and, and continuance of imperialism. Mm -hmm. These lines were arbitrarily drawn. Yes. Yes. And if if the if the British gave the um Schomburg the the the, the rice or to to draw the line, then he of course he will draw the line in favor of the British. And and in that way was actually but, claiming land. And now you talk about eighteen forty one, eighteen forty one. This is what we're 18, talking about. Eighteen forty one. Yeah. Right. So the, the so prior to eighteen in eighteen sorry, my mistake in the Venezuela boundary dispute officially began in 1841. That yes. dispute was going on since 1841. Right. Uh, and, and so right? this line... Because from 1814, we know that Great Britain had acquired British Canada you know, by treaty with the Netherlands. Right. So, so Venezuela is... What is Venezuela saying now? Venezuela seems to be saying that this line, the, the Schomburg line that you're talking about, they're saying, they're, they, are, are they going all the way back to the Schomburg line to say that this is where the source of a contention is? Remember the, the Venezuela appealed to the United States at the time, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, and you remember, um, with President Monroe, with the Monroe Doctrine, the mm -hmm. Monroe Doctrine stated that, well, Europe, well, the European powers had no claims to the Americas. That's right. it, because America was expanding to become an imperialist nation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so they saw Brit the European encroachment in, in, the, in, the, in, 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 the, in the West, in Latin America, as, so they told, they told these countries, look, the Americas now belong to us. So Venezuela appealed to the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that appeal was never... Um, it was never really officially documented in the sense that America didn't really rule in favor of, of Venezuela in, 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 in any significant way. Mm -hmm. So that, or that that dispute is still ongoing. Still ongoing. And then and, um, to, to reiterate um, something that you read now from that um, document, that historical document, so, so that took us to from 1841 to the arbitration finally um, in 1899. That, right. Um, so in 1876, mm -hmm. Venezuela protested, right, to, mm -hmm. and broke diplomatic relations. And in, <clears throat> in 1895, the, the United States invoked the Monroe Doctrine. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the arbitration in it, my reading carefully, however, when the commission finally rendered the decision on October 3rd, 1899, it directed that the border follow the Schomburg line. In other words, uh, the, the Americans agreed 
that the, the Venezuela should follow the, the Schomburg line. But that does not mean that the Schomburg line is the correct line. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and because of course you, that that document well, exactly Britain, because Venice, both Britain mm-hmm. and Britain and America were in alliance in a sense in 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 in, in terms of the world. Mm-hmm. So they were not uh, ruling in favor of Spain or of, of, of Venezuela, who had won its independence of Spain. And this is where Venezuela is today is saying that they do not recognize that 1899 arbitral award, um, which ruled in favor exactly. of the of the Schomburg exactly. line. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah. that award actually solidified the borders of, of what then was British Guyana. But, um, but, but you yeah. also, in that document that you have, also pointed to the fact that Venezuela ratified, um, an agreement. Was this, um, 1899 or was it later in 1966? Hold on, no. In the 60s? Because I know that there was 1899. Okay, so Venezuela, um, raised this issue. In, you know, in the 1840s, 70s, um, that Guyana, the border... Let me read it from here. Mm-hmm. In 1876, Venezuela pro- protested, broke diplomatic relations with Great Britain and appealed to the United States for assistance, citing the Mono Doctrine as justification for U.S. involvement. For the next 19 years, Venezuela repeatedly petitioned for U.S. assistance calling on this neighbor to the north to intervene by either sponsoring arbitration or intervening with force. The United States responded by expressing concern but did little to facilitate a resolution. Right? But, so but, but sometime after... It, an 18... it was never resolved. So here, so, but but so sometime later, Dr. Vincent, in 1899... In October mm-hmm. till 1899... Yes. The United States, um, I'm going to read it from here. Great Britain under pressure in South Africa with the Boers and managing an empire that spanned the globe could ill afford another conflict. Lord Salisbury's government submitted the dispute to the American Boundary Commission and said nothing else of the Monroe Doctrine. Venezuela enthusiastically submitted to arbitration certain that the commission would decide in its favor. However, when the commission finally rendered a decision on October 3, 1899, it directed the, that the border follow the Schomburg line, allowing, although of rejection of Great Britain's increasing extravagant claims, the ruling preserved the 1835 de- demarcation. Mm-hmm. Disappointed, the Venezuela's quietly ratified the commission's finding. So Venezuela, although disappointed, because I think this is what Maduro is saying that um, yeah, they ratified the finding. So the Venezuela had to go back to their historical document and see and 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 verify that. Do I want Maduro never? If you ratify the finding, it means that you agreed. And then we have the 1966 Geneva Agreement. I, I'm not quite sure um, how much you um, if that document um, references that that. Uh, Geneva Agreement between Guyana and Venezuela in 1966, which later on uh, agreed to resolve that dispute through peaceful means um, and, and then to, to seek international arbitration. But this, this is something that, that obviously, if you have 19, if you had a, a ratification in 1899 and then there was another 1990, 1966 issue, then it points to um, a dissatisfaction. Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's an ongoing, it's, uh, it's an ongoing, but we have to go back to the thing. If Britain claim another 30,000 square miles after the Nishon book line, they went back and claim another, when gold was formed, they claim another 30,000 square miles. Yes. So, 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 so looking at this through, um, our post-colonial, um, lenses, um, you know, I, I, we, I, I think for us as African-centered people, we find ourselves with a dilemma. Um, I don't, I'm not quite sure, sure about you, <laughs> but for me personally, that I'm, I'm firmly, um, on, the, on, on, in, in, in Guyana's camp on this. Um, and, and I'll, and I'll say later on in the program, I've, I've been saying it for the last two weeks. You're looking at two thirds of Guyana now. Um, but then 
there is here we have a situation where land is in contention where the land um the the, the, the rhetoric coming from Guyana is that the land originally Essequibo belongs to to Guyana to to Venezuela this is what Venezuela is saying Guyana is saying the same thing but the historical records especially from the archives that you just read are showing you that well first of all it belonged to the indigenous people the people in in the, in that well, the land was belong to the land was belong the land belong to the the indigenous people with colonialism right mm-hmm. when the dutch the dutch the dutch had control of the ghanas what we called it was well it was the ghanas and then the mm-hmm. french came had part of the ghanas so you had the, the the Netherlands there, yeah, right? Suriname and all those places, what we call Suriname today. Uh, although that was called the Ghanas. It just mm-hmm. belonged to the Dutch. Mm-hmm. So the British bought, made a treaty with the Dutch. And they, and they bought that part of the Ghanas and called it British Ghana. Mm-hmm. And you know, I'm right? saying... Still uh, have the, right? We have and then the, the Suriname still remain with the Dutch and then the... Cayenne, the French came in and, and, and carved up Cayenne, but still the leaders now have independence. Um, right? So those, those old colonial treaties that go back to different types of wars between the Netherlands and the British, the British and the French, etc., etc. And so, so boundaries in, in, in the New World were, were arbitrarily drawn. Yes, yes. First, the lands were taken, from the, taken away from the, indi- the indigenous people. Mm-hmm. And I'm because I'm sure because you remember the Amerindians. They are still in there. the region. They, they are, had no dispute. They were good. They, the Venezuela had Amerindians, just one family, right, one right? land. They were trading and crossing. They they didn't have no line to say, well, this this yes. is my territory or this is your territory. They were sharing the Essequibo the River and the Orinoco River together. The thing about it now, though, is that the people who are in that region, in the Essequibo region, that is disputed, 125,000 people out of the 800,000 um, um, Guyana population, that these people, for the main majority, 90, I, uh, the last I heard in terms of... Um, Statistics: ninety odd percent of the people living in this disputed region are Amerindians. These are original mm-hmm. in, indigenous people. So, do they get yep. a say in in all of this? Is a question. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. They have no say. They have been marginalized. <laughs> they have no say in the dispute. Right. Um, there's another thing that we see happening. Um, colonialism, of course, is at work, and uh, so we see. Uh, obviously, gold is there now. Uh, the in the referendum um, today, I know they're asking: Should one of the questions is should uh, th- that region become a state of um, Venezuela, and should the people, the Amerindians living there, should they be granted Venezuela citizenship? That's that's on the referendum. So there is that. But what do you think about the extent now, the American involvement at this stage? Because America seems to be. Over- no, we- See, we had to go back to the again the Monroe Doctrine. If you, if you yes. go and I, I, I wanted for people in the Caribbean to read the Monroe Doctrine and what yes. it says. Yes. If okay. it's, it's easy to Google, you Google the Monroe Doctrine, and you see what the United States when it began to to grow its its yeah. Western expansion outward. Yeah. Um, right. It so saw Latin America and the Caribbean as its fear of influence mm-hmm. and it and it warned Britain and other European powers to back off. This is our territory. Mm-hmm. In essence the the the, the Americans in, in from the Monroe Doctrine said, look, the Americas belong to us. Mm-hmm. And at the and same so, time, uh, and coupled with the Monroe Doctrine, which, uh, you know, says you can't interfere if you're European, you can't interfere on this side of the world, what, what we, and what we claim is ours, the principle of uti, or uti, uti possidetis, um, which, which really is, uh, it, it complements in a way the Monroe Doctrine for them because it, it originated in that context of decolonization, particularly for Latin America, Africa, and Asia, which means that, um, as you, as you, as you possess, you know, as you, you own it as you possess it. So basically that's what it translates to. But we also have a, a situation now, um, in, in, in the region where we have the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative and we have, as we have AFRICOM on the continent of Africa, which is the militarization of Africa, we have SOUTHCOM in these waters, 
which is a militarization of the Caribbean and um and, and South American waters. So so we see now where Venezuela is saying that Southcom is actually in Guyana. And 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 this for us is is a crazy situation if and it seems to be true because I saw um something this morning where the presence is really there. What does that mean for the region when you have the American military in Guyana now to to defend, so to speak, the borders against Venezuela? Well, you see, that whole that whole conflict with Venezuela and the United States, you know, is ongoing, and, and other nations are, are joining in terms of proxies in terms of where your allegiance to stand with America in the region. Yes. Um, it is, we're going to continue the conversation on this, but um, you, you have, what you have done for us, uh, Dr. Vincent, is really to put this in, in a historical context, and thank you so much for that. That document that you have, I'd really like a copy of that, because this um, is straight from... I can, I can um, I'll forward it to you. Yes, please, because this is straight from the horse's mouth. This is what they were doing. Um, and recording at the same time. Is that yeah, this is this case, yeah. this is from the um, U.S. State Department archives. Yeah. So is that WikiLeaks? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doctor Vincent. Really appreciate. Yeah. So I will. Um, I will. I will. I will forward it to you. Um, yes. And congratulations. Congratulations on your book. Um, the book is out. Um, can you tell us a little bit about it and where we can get a copy of it? Um. Yes, the book is out. Um, there is a website called Caribbean Books Network, and um, it's I, I can forward you the website, and yes. you can share it with people in Jamaica and the region. All right. Thank you so much. But the much. book is out, and uh, we are doing book launching, the, so I guess... Yes. Uh, at another time, you can have me on to talk about the book. Most definitely. When I've read the book, I'd, I've already ordered my copy. I hope it's on, on its way to me. And um, I, okay. hope, I hope that we can we can talk soon about it. Thank you so much, Dr. Vincent. Sure. Or, Thank you very much. In Venezuela, they are saying the Venezuelan sun rises in Essequibo. Essequibo belongs... To Venezuela. This is what is happening today. The five questions uh, referendum happening today in Venezuela. There is an underlying issue here because even while we're talking about this, thinking that nah, there's, they're not going to war, you know. Um, remember the Falklands and and there's remember Grenada. There's some things that seem innocuous at first and. You know, it's just gradually escalate, escalate, escalate. And I'm thinking that this has the possibility that there is a potential for this kind of uh, escalation in this region because of the politics that is involved in this. We're standing by for my next um, special guest online. Our brother David Mohammed, uh, whom we have introduced already in this space um, earlier in a, a few minutes ago, has joined us on the phone lines. Uh, he's not in Trinidad. He's in the United Kingdom. Good morning to you, uh, David. How are you doing? I am great, thank you. I hope you're well also and greetings to uh, all of the listeners, all of the beautiful people in Jamaica right. that I miss so much. Greetings to you, my brother. Thank you so much uh, for joining us from cold, cold England this morning. Um, so, so we're looking at this situation that's unfolding. We had Dr. Godfrey Vincent yeah. just putting that into a historical uh, context for us. Mm-hmm. And um, today we are watching to see where the referendum goes. Uh, five questions. With you, I want to uh, to start with what happened at, um, well, first of all, your perspective, because give us a minute or so of your perspective on the historical context of this. Too. Right. Well, historically, as with many other situations, many other land disputes, many other border settlements, and something that I intend to speak about very soon as well is the humanitarian crisis in the Congo, mm-hmm. which is probably the world's most ignored humanitarian 
humanitarian situation. All of these issues, coming back to Venezuela, Guyana, mm -hmm. and even Palestine, Israel, for that matter, mm -hmm. most of it, if not all of it, goes back to European theft, European interference, and the establishment of systems of government and administration that continue in motion even after they're gone. Mm -hmm. So this region called Esequibo in Guyana was first taken up by the Dutch. And the region of the Netherlands in particular that occupied there was a region called Zealand. Now, that alone tells a whole story by itself because you'll notice in the world now that there's Zealand in the Netherlands. Now there's New Zealand, which is another country that was stolen. Mm -hmm. Just like in Europe, you have Hampshire. In America, you have New Hampshire. In mm -hmm. Europe, you have Oxford. In America, you have New Oxford. Mm -hmm. In England, you have York. In America, you have New York. Mm -hmm. And south to the United States, you have Mexico. And then in the United States of America, they stole part of Mexico and they called it New Mexico. Mm -hmm. So this was how Esequibo was first established by the Zealanders, who also stole land later on, which became New Zealand, but they were Dutch. And then you have a back and forth, which I'll skip between the British and the Dutch, and they go back and forth. And then, of course, British Guyana was established as three colonies which were Damarara, Esquibo, Esquibo and Burbi. And that was what we knew as Guyana. Now, who the land belongs to? It belongs to the original people. Mm -hmm. Who are still there? And one of the... Yes. But, but hold on, not necessarily the same original people that we may identify as Amerindian. Of course, they have a legitimate claim. Mm -hmm. But... It's almost ironic that one of the world's greatest professors of black studies who has dealt with that topic of indigenous African people in the Americas is actually from Guyana. True. And I'm referring to the great professor Ivan Van Sertima. Yeah, of course, they came before Columbus. Ivan Van Sertima, mm -hmm. yeah, who, who um, did that whole series of African presence in the West before Columbus. Mm -hmm. We'll show you that African people were there originally. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a uh, historical background. But the bottom line is, America got involved on the invitation of Venezuela. Venezuela became independent since the early 1800s. Guyana became independent in 1966. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there was this dispute. Yes, there was this disagreement, but Venezuela wanted to settle it with England. England, who had territories all over the world, were not interested in settling it. So Venezuela, in the early 1800s, broke off diplomatic ties with England, and they went to America and asked America, to help them settle this border dispute. Mm -hmm. Now, when they did that, America under President Cleveland, mm -hmm. Grover Cleveland, he reinvoked this very threatening law that looms over all of us up to this day in 2023 in the Caribbean. And that is the Monroe Doctrine. Mm -hmm. So the first president of the United States, James Monroe, established a position that we're not going to seek to colonize further nations in the Western Hemisphere, but if any Europeans from outside interfere in our hemisphere, we will take the position of the world policeman. Mm -hmm. So Venezuela breaks diplomatic ties with England. They go to America for help. America under President Cleveland says we will help under our fifth president's doctrine, the Monroe Doctrine, and then, of course, Britain, under their prime minister at the time, Lord Salisbury, said, okay, let's sit down and talk about this. This was 
seven. Uh-huh, and they, they agreed, this is all parties now, mm-hmm. but we can't really say Guyana, because Guyana, of course, was really Britain, Brit- yeah, British Guyana. along with Venezuela, who were already independent at the time, mm-hmm. and America. They came together and said, listen, let us form an international tribunal to discuss this matter, let them do the research, let them come up with all the findings, let them study the history, and then they will make a decision, and all of us will agree to it. They would have asked, is everyone fine with that? Yes, everyone mm-hmm. agreed to it. So, this commission, in 1897, consisted of five judges as a panel. Two from Britain, who would have been representing, of course, British Diana's interests. Mm-hmm. Two from America, who were representing the Venezuelan interests, and a third party who was Russian. They met and resided in Paris in France and studied extensively the land, the maps, the cartography, the history, the boundaries, the territory. And then two years later, in 1899, Mm-hmm. They handed down their decision. Mm-hmm. And the decision was three against two. Of course, the two British and the Russians voted for, and the two Americans voted against. The decision was that 94% of the disputed territory should remain with British Guyana and 6% of that land should go to Venezuela, which was the mouth of the Orinoco River Mm -hmm. and a short stretch of the Atlantic coastline. Now, of course, Venezuela were not happy, but six years later, in 1905, the history was settled. Both sides accepted the boundary. They got a German cartographer to... Ralph the map, he was Robert Herman Schomburg. Mm-hmm. Everyone looked at it. Everyone said, okay, we will accept this. Mm-hmm. And it was settled in 1905. Mm-hmm. Now, there were two factors that would have reignited it. One is, of course, and let's, let's just be plain and impolite about it, Guyana has recently discovered oil. Yes. And yes. Guyana now is on the threshold of untold economic success stories and financial liberation, especially coming out of a period of such hardship. Mm-hmm. And I want so I, I want I want to pause for a minute to talk about yes, yes. that. I know it's a lot. I yes, know it's a lot. no, no, it's a lot. But because but but we but it's, it's very, you, what you're doing is is, is pretty good because it, we were able to follow the conversation and to follow the history, especially because we just heard from Dr. Vincent, who had the archival document out of the 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 U.S. archives. Um, just out laying out America's involvement and what you're doing for, for yeah. us is to fill that in and to kind of widen it out for us to see who else were, uh, who are the other persons who were involved, Russia, for example, that the vote was 3-2. And, and, and that, that fills a gap because, um, Venezuela, um, seemed to have always had this dissatisfaction with the, the arbitration, that arbitration tr- tribunal um, that came out of Paris in 1899, they seem to have had a problem with it yeah. over time, even though they ratified it. So what you're doing for us is helping us to understand it a bit more. All, but, but to take us now to this period... Um, where mm-hmm. here we are again, this, is, this, is, this has been ongoing because obviously the, the I think from 2015 it, it, it all came up again. Uh, yeah. What? Let us understand what's happening in the region at this time around 2015 and even before. Um, what was happening in Guyana before the discovery of uh, this? Uh, wow, the world's greatest crude oil reserves. What was what was the socio economic situation in Guyana? Well, of course, Guyana has been known to have a difficult um, economy um, going back to the days of. Of course, their first president, Shady Dagan, uh, who was succeeded by the great Forbes Burnham, who I believe has been the most vilified leader of any Caribbean nation. Mm-hmm. I mean, a, a lot of other 
Republicans who want to claim that they are the ones taking both sides. But I think without the doubt, it's been them. Mm-hmm. Um, we admire and respect Forbes Burnham as one of the four founding fathers of CARICOM in 1973, along with Michael Manley, Dr. Eric Williams, and Errol Barrow of Barbados. Mm-hmm. But in 1982, apparently, under Forbes Burnham, the issue did come up again. And there's even a calypso out of Guyana that is speaking on the matter and saying that they're not going to give up any of the territory. Mm-hmm. Now, the economic hardship in Guyana has been um, pretty harsh because their main mineral resources, they've been relying on bauxite and timber, but they also have the added complication of being the largest territory <coughs> in Caracom by far. I mean, Guyana is the size of England, but mm-hmm. England's population is almost 60 million. Guyana's population is still under 1 million. 800,000. So they've had, yeah, about mm-hmm. 800,000. I mean, it would be a million soon. Uh, and so, so they, they've had um, these difficulties. They're also the only country in the English-speaking Caribbean that has had racial violent conflict mm-hmm. between the, you know, between the Africans and Indians. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there are reasons for that, which could take a different yes, analysis. Yes. But, but you know, and, and the whole idea of the black market. The, what they call the white market was mm-hmm. prominent in the 1980s. Mm-hmm. The scarcity of a lot of goods that were being sold. Um, but Guyana has given us so many brilliant um, writers and researchers and mm-hmm. icons in the African Caribbean community. I mean, for Benham himself, mm-hmm. who was actually the brainchild of Carisester, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. as well as the course, Professor Ivan Van Sutton, one of the greatest mm-hmm. Black Studies professors, also Cecil Bessmore, mm-hmm. even the great Eddie Grant, who mm-hmm. was largely responsible for bringing Caribbean music into Britain, along with the Jamaican reggae artist. Mm-hmm. Um, and even though, so we, even though Jamaica has uh, Jamaica has adopted um, wholesale Walter Rodney, um, the Jamaican people, not the government, of course. Yeah, um, Walter the, Rodney, of course. <laughs> um, you know, because Walter right. Rodney was in Jamaica when he wrote Ground Into with My Brothers. Right, but right. how he was going to develop Africa, yeah. um, you know, coming out of, of Guyana as well was a major factor. And even, even England's most prominent... Um, Black member of parliament. Mm-hmm. He's a member of parliament for Tottenham, mm-hmm. David Lamy. Yeah. He also has Guyanese parents. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, many others. Joy Reid, who's mm-hmm. on MSNBC in America. Mm-hmm. You know, she has Guyanese mm-hmm. parentage as well. Mm-hmm. So, Guyana has contributed so much. Right, so so the, the, and, and, and uh, so I want to so, look. So, so, so this is the community of consciousness. Yeah. yeah, so I want to also look at um, Venezuela because these are two yeah. countries now that um, uh, obviously uh, Guyana is the, the, it's it's unequal in 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 many ways in terms of you're talking about although the size of of, of England eight hundred thousand population most of Guyana is yeah. um, rainforest that entire area the Essequibo area is is um, mainly rainforest by the way. But um, so, so Venezuela itself, um, just during Chavez, I think, and, and and after Chavez, if we could take it from there. Yeah, well, Venezuela, of course, um, is going through its own crisis as we speak. I mean, Trinidad and Tobago's population is 1.4 million. It's estimated. No one knows the actual figures, but it's estimated that right now, as much as approximately, well, estimates go up between 7 and 11% of the Trinidad population are persons who came across on boats from Venezuela over the last five or six years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we have expressed concern, not about the presence of anyone, because we have always been a people to welcome anyone else mm-hmm. who is in need of any kind of exile, 
But when we have Africans from Africa who actually intermarry into African Trinidadian population, when we have them being detained unfairly um, in detention centers and persons from other parts of the region coming in and not receiving the same kind of welcome, mm. um, you know, we, we see that Venezuela is welcome with open arms. Mm-hmm. Also, a significant number of Venezuelans have gone into, not as much, but quite a few have gone into Guyana. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then you have had, um, of course, Colombia. Colombia has had, I mean, it's estimated probably <clears throat> as much as a million. Mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, this sort of jacks up the crime rate because Venezuela now has the second highest murder rate in the world. And the highest murder rate using illegal firearms, 90% of the murders in Venezuela are done with illegal firearms. And they do have the, I mean, again, one report says they have the highest oil deposits, largest oil deposits in the world. Mm -hmm. So clearly there's a management issue. Um, They have these food shortages. Mm -hmm. I had a statistic in January 2008, 24.7% of goods were reported to not be available in Venezuela. Food shortages increased again in January 2012, a new record high of 28% of their food needs not available in Venezuela in 2014. Mm-hmm. And then the fateful day came in 2016, which is when Colombia... I mean, listen, imagine their neighbors, Colombia, opened their borders for 12 hours. For, and I'm talking about Venezuelans walking across, mm-hmm. on foot, mm-hmm. driving across. That would have been July the 10th, 2016. Mm-hmm. And in 12 hours, 35,000 Venezuelans fled their country. Mm-hmm. And then over the next couple of days, 123,000 Venezuelans crossed into Colombia, um, seeking food, seeking any kind of opportunity. And that, that's just two days. Mm-hmm. 123,000 Venezuelans, out of a population of approximately 33 million, Venezuela, Venezuela also- their country. Venezuela also um, has dealt with over the years um, some serious um, sanctions coming um, from the United <coughs> States and and Europe and other countries. Um, they've they've had some serious sanctions in Venezuela for, for many many years, um, uh, and so it would be interesting to kind of look at to analyze how that is playing into. Um, what what is unfolding now and from a political perspective? Uh, the what what do you think? What are your own thoughts on the America Venezuela relationship? Obviously, yeah. sanctions were lifted the other day. Some, not all, some were lifted the other day, yeah. and America has gone to Venezuela for oil because now they are in this problem with with Russia. So there is also that as we speak. Um, what, what what what's your take on all of that? Well. One of the most interesting things about this is how the tables have changed. Because when the border dispute was being arbitrated between 1897 and 1899, Venezuela were running to America for help. Mm-hmm. And it was Russia who was fighting with Britain against, against um, Venezuela. Now, America sees Venezuela as one of its peripheral enemies and Russia is seen as the ally. So, of course, the whole fear in the region um, of the, the communist influence and the sympathy towards Russia, and, of course, we have the proxy Cuba, and there are now so many good diplomatic relations between Caribbean nations and China. Mm-hmm. So once Russia, China, and by extension Cuba come in the picture, then America raises red flags. Mm -hmm. So because since the... And again, it it was somewhat of a military takeover that brought in Hugo Chavez in 1992 Mm -hmm. into Venezuela. So they tend to scorn 
those kinds of political slash military operations. You see, America doesn't support coups in other countries unless they fund them themselves. Mm Mm-hmm. You understand? Unless they orchestrate them themselves. Like the one, they, again, the, they just, similar to the one they were orchestrating in Venezuela up until the time of the Ukraine um, Russia um, exactly. conflict. And Grenada mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the Congo. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the Belgium. Of course, and, Sudan. I mean, it's, it's, yes. it's such a consistent mm-hmm. pattern. Yes. And then all of the African countries, mm-hmm. the so called coup belt, uh, mm-hmm. Sudan, Mauritius. Chad, mm-hmm. Niger, mm-hmm. Ivory Coast, Libya. They will have this French dominant influence mm-hmm. in the politics and in the military. Mm-hmm. It's so horrific. Yeah, America, America is a rabid, Palestine. America is a rabid, a rabid, um, psychopathic, um, you know, character when it comes to its relations, its international relations and its relations with, with other countries. So, 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 they, we see the same yeah, thing. But okay. Europe, Europe in general, Europe in general. And mm-hmm. I mean, my beloved sister, you know how terrible America's history is in that regard. Yes. But of course, we can even present arguments to say that England history is even worse. But you know who else is right up there for those two? Mm. France. Oh, goodness. Because, again, <laughs> all of, most of the military and political instability yes. in Africa today is yes. still linked to France. Right. Belgium weren't too far behind either because, remember, the Belgians, uh, think about these good statements. The Belgians, took over the Congo from 1885. But the Congo only became a Belgian colony in 1906. Mm. Doesn't that sound kind of awkward? How could they take over in 1885 that Mm -hmm. it only became a colony in 1906? And the reason for that is Mm -hmm. the whole country, the Congo, which had so much mineral wealth and resources in it, from 1885 to 1906 for 11 years was the private property of King Leopold. One man mm-hmm. owned the whole country. And, and it you was know, only I... because of the, the rumors and the factual report mm-hmm. of the atrocities and crimes against humanity that he was um, guilty of, killing millions of African people. King Leopold killed more Africans than Hitler killed Jews. Yeah. But he's not even considered a bad man in many circles. Not Until in 1906, Belgium took a decision and said, look, we have to take this country from this one man. Not to give independence to the people. Mm-hmm. They took it from him and the country took it over. The parliament took it over. Hold the line. But they have such a history that is consistent with all of this. Hold the line for me, Dave. That is, um, in spite of the fact that Guyana had asked the International Court of Justice to intervene. <laughs> I don't know what Guyana thought. Uh, the, the ICJ, I think, would not have done that any, on, on any day. But they had expected that that would have happened to stop the referendum. And, that, and the, 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 the ICJ gave its ruling on Friday. Um, ruling interesting because it depends on which side of the fence you're on or if you're on the fence, how you would have interpreted this, um, right, D- David? Because Guyana, yeah. was, Guyana says they won at the ICJ. Venezuela said it was a victory for them. And those who are on the fence said, well, this is, this is a good thing. Um, because basically what the ICJ has said is, um, Guyana should, Venezuela shouldn't do anything to upset the status quo. But Guyana really mm-hmm. was asking for the referendum. For, for, for the ICJ to rule on whether the referendum could go ahead. But that referendum is underway as we speak. Um, President Maduro has already voted and it is, um, a festive spirit. I'm looking at the newspapers coming out of Venezuela. <laughs> it's a, it's a festive spirit. It's high parties like Carnival. That's happening down there. Uh, Spring Garden are coming kind of thing in, in Venezuela this morning. People are out in their numbers voting on these five questions, which we want to get to those five questions. But I want to wrap this, um, brother David, because what you have done here in terms yeah. of kind of broadening this, um, to a, glo- in a global, um, through a global lens is to say wherever the colonizers go, they have created these problems. 
and have left um, people, because this is not just land, it's people, um, warring against each other for land that their ancestors um, lived on centuries before. Now, um, bearing that in mind, what do you think is the... The, 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 is there a reparations conversation to be had even in this dispute that is going on right now in, in Guyana? Guyana, Venezuela? Mm. Again, we must ground this particular conversation in the research of Professor Ivan Van Sigma. Mm-hmm. We cannot just leave that as peripheral leisure reading. Mm-hmm. We have to recognize our African heritage and legacy and connected to our existence as CARICOM state. Mm-hmm. If we ignore that, then that would be our own detriment and others will be able to come in and take advantage and continue a legacy of staff on their part. Mm-hmm. You know, I have one unfortunate thing to say in regards to my research on this Venezuela Guyana situation and that is and this is not entirely so. But I have noticed that most of the people that I've spoken to who are Venezuelan or who grew up in Venezuela were very much aware of this land dispute. Very much aware. They learned about it in elementary school. Mm-hmm. A lot of our people from Guyana, though, and again, there are, of course, several exceptions, but I'm talking about by majority. A lot of our people in Guyana were not as familiar with it until it became an issue. Mm -hmm. Because remember, Mm -hmm. Venezuela were independent Mm -hmm. since 1811. Mm -hmm. Guyana, even after we became independent in 1966, we still continue with a colonial and post-colonial educational system Mm -hmm. that teaches the empowerment of European civilization and that continued spread in contemporary times. Mm -hmm. This is why the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and a delegation from the Nation of Islam from the late 90s into the early 2000s went to Africa, went mm-hmm. to the Sudan, mm-hmm. met with the leaders of the faction, went to the Congo, mm-hmm. went to Ghana, Nigeria, went to Libya in person with researchers yeah. and writers and journalists. And, 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 of, and you, and I, I can have to report it so that we don't have to rely exactly. on BBC, CNN, exactly. Fox, and ABC. Yes, exactly. And this is what we have to do. We yes. don't have to go too far to research our own history. Yes. We are already right there. Mm-hmm. But we must document it in such a way that it empowers our next generation mm-hmm. so that we don't have to be scrambling for information when those detrimental times come. And with mm-hmm. reparations, it's the same thing. Yeah. Right. So, so uh, 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 you know, I've been looking at this, saying to myself that, you know, this is, with all of the conversations we, we're having, yes, we're paying um, attention to the referendum, but yes, I agree with you. We must ground this in the works of uh, Professor Van Sertima and the reparations um, conversation. This must become part of that question. All right. In the meantime, though, what do you think... Um, is the significance of the referendum today, what makes today's referendum on Esequibo in Venezuela particularly significant? Mm. How does it fit into the region, well, the, the broader yeah, regional are, dynamics? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there are a few um, different theories on that. One is that uh, President Nicolas Maduro is under social pressures within the borders of his own country, and a move like this would be seen as very nationalistic with patriotic intentions to increase the wealth pool of his country. Um, But we have to bear in mind, and all of us have to bear in mind, that what he is proposing is to take CARICOM territory. It's not just Guyana, but it is part of the union of mm-hmm. Jamaica, of Trinidad, of Barbados, and all the other Caribbean nations. That is what is at stake here. We can't just see it as Guyana. The international um, court did say nothing should be done to disrupt the tranquility of the region mm-hmm. as it should be respected as a zone of peace. And CARICOM, who have very good relations with Venezuela, mm-hmm. reminded Venezuela after the ruling They said Venezuela cannot, by a referendum or otherwise, 
violate international law and disregard the order of the world's highest court. Mm -hmm. So there will be um, other um, diplomatic and trade and harmonious consequences if they proceed with this. And I think if, let's say, the referendum is in favor of the government taking that action, I think it will be. To be honest, Mm -hmm. my estimation is that it would probably be about 70% yes. Because you have to bear in mind as well that most of those who oppose the government of Nicolas Maduro are the ones who fled. Mm -hmm. So if there are 100,000 Venezuelans in Trinidad right now, you do a survey among them, Mm-hmm. Most of them will probably say no, mm-hmm. because they're the ones who are displeased with it. As a matter of fact, there are Venezuelans outside of Venezuela who are having little marches and protests and demonstrations in support of Diana. I've noticed that. So, and also, and also yes, asking for the sanctions. Yes. Well. Yeah. But, but they're not... But the thing is, all, all the ones who support him are the ones who will be voting. Right. These ones who have fled Venezuela are not the ones who will be participating in the referendum. The images that I see coming out of Venezuela, the children are involved, <laughs> um, the eight flags, yes. um, the, you know, the Venezuelan sun rises in Esequibo. I mean, the, the, it yes. is like a party today in, in Venezuela. Uh, Maduro voted. <laughs> yes. When I, when I came on air this morning, when I was introducing my program at 615, Maduro had already voted. I had to be, keep checking time. <laughs> what time is it in Venezuela yes. now? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so we do have that, um, festive thing going on but there are implications as you pointed what are implications for the region um many people are saying that they don't see where this will escalate into um a a, a war but but a few things are happening and i want you to comment on this one is that brazil mm-hmm. brazil has already moved troops yeah. along its borders and 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 they say they're yeah. doing this in in response to what they see happening in the area they are already um not scuffles but movements of troops from the guy from the Venezuela end also. But you talk about a country, Venezuela, that has 28.2 million people. Guyana that has 800,000. We see the United States of America has gone in with South, with Southcom, Southcom, you know, yeah. um, in, into Guyana. What are the wider implications of that? What is really happening here? And can we ignore ExxonMobil and the United States behind all of this? <laughs> No, we most certainly cannot. I, let, let, let me recommend to our listeners that they go and see that new movie that just came out on Napoleon. All right? Because for two main reasons. One, of course, and they did not portray people over here in the film, even though to other Caribbean people, that was probably the major part of Napoleon's biography. And second, remember Napoleon reintroduced slavery. So even after slavery was abolished in the French colonies, and Napoleon betrayed and tricked Tupé Louverture, got him to leave Haiti in prison, then he died under Napoleon, they reintroduced slavery. Now, none of those things were portrayed in the film about Napoleon's life, which simply says one thing. Those episodes in history were not important to them. But they're important to us. Mm-hmm. Same thing with America and where they choose to put their military and business footprint. They don't necessarily take into consideration what's in the best interest of the population that they disrupt. Mm-hmm. They simply use the term America's vital interest. Look mm-hmm. at Henry Kissinger. Mm-hmm. He died at 100 years old, what, mm-hmm. about three or four days ago. It, te- it, it, yeah, it, it really tests something your faith. I believe me, tests your faith. <laughs> to see the devil, yeah, the devil, you know. I him as a hero. Yeah. He was the architect of the population of third world countries. He was seen as a war criminal. It makes you wonder about the universe. But again, it, it depends on who is doing the talking, who is doing the reporting. Yes, yes. So we cannot adopt wholesale America's interest and think that there's some kind of distant intention to benefit us. They're going in for their wealth and their resources, even if it means 
Is Guyana is Guyana then making a mistake? Is Guyana making a mistake? And why is CARICOM? I heard um, Professor Mark Curtin calling on CARICOM to convene a summit because he says that a, a press release, a statement is not enough coming from 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 the CARICOM. He says this is mm. urgent enough for CARICOM to convene a summit. But CARICOM seems to have is kowtowing to to the United States and of course the United States is it, it is where it is um, you know uh, ExxonMobil Shell and, and, and oil yeah. remember they had gone into Venezuela for um, they had gone into Venezuela for oil you know and this is why they have lifted some of the sanctions mm-hmm. now they're mm-hmm. in now that there is an opportunity and this is what it seems like to me I'm not quite sure if they didn't create the opportunity themselves to capture more fully Guyana's oil. Because as it is now, they're saying they don't, they're not going to set up a base on Guyana, but they're there with Southcom. That's a militarization of Guyana. Right. Because That's Guyana needs that help. So, if, if America sets up uh, office mm-hmm. with nothing but pen, papers, and computers, mm-hmm. trust me, mm-hmm. that within itself represent military occupation. Mm-hmm. You don't have to physically see troops in roles and tanks. So Guyana is making a mistake. Missile launches. Is Guyana making a mistake? Well, you see, the, the, the thing is, it, it's difficult to refer to it as a mistake mm. based on what is the threat. The threat because of the threat, yes. I mean, even CARICOM, mm. the entire English-speaking population of CARICOM is still left than, I mean, you're talking about barely mm. six or seven million people mm. to Venezuela's mm. population. 28.2 million, million so even, yes. e- even the military resources mm-hmm. of CARICOM mm-hmm. um, would not be sufficient to combat mm-hmm. Venezuela militarily. So this is an opportunity so for it America. Is, it is yes. for this reason that mm-hmm. our unitary states they mm-hmm. seek in various forums, such mm-hmm. as the United Nations, mm-hmm. with the strengthening and backup of the International Criminal Court, mm-hmm. with all of the petrol caribe deals and other mm-hmm. milestones that there have been in diplomatic relations. Mm-hmm. That is our strength at this point, mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. take an ideological position that can put sufficient pressure on mm-hmm. Venezuela mm-hmm. for them to make visible the consequences of their actions. Mm-hmm. They're not going to gain mm-hmm. anything from a move like that except to be more ostracized, more branded. The Caribbean have been some of their only friends nearby. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now you're going to do this, not again, not just to Guyana. I'm not just looking at it as Guyana. Mm-hmm. You're going to do that to 15 CARICOM nations mm-hmm. who have been there as brothers to you. Do you know that Trinidad and Tobago welcomed the Venezuelan vice president, mm-hmm. Delcy Rodriguez, yes. during the COVID, you know, during that whole um, pandemic scandal. Mm-hmm. And she, at the time, was on some watch list for the United States. Yes. And the American government called for Trinidad to explain why they entertain Vice President Delcy Rodriguez as the base secretary. Mm. We defended Venezuela. We stood up against mm-hmm. America. Mm-hmm. We defend Venezuela and say that these are our neighbors. Right. It's this... like I can't go right next door for a diplomatic conversation. Mm-hmm. And how, how can I have someone so far away yeah. um, claiming this interference? So we have stood with them. Yeah. We have been available for their citizens to flee. We've welcomed them with open arms. Mm-hmm. There's just no logic in taking yeah. uh, positional stance like that. Obviously, the regional implications um, and the impact on regional relations, because already we see um, where both Ralph Gonzalez and uh, Mia Motley had to walk back a comment they made, which saw them wanting to sit on the fence. They had come out earlier, strongly, in favor of Guyana, but mm-hmm. then they had walked it back a bit and was kind of straddling both, right? Obviously because of the relations, the, the regional relations. Yeah. And, and, and they had to call a press conference because the, the rest of the Caribbean, the people of Barbados, the rest of the Caribbean and so on, people came down at them really hard. So this is how serious it is. And then we have Professor Mark Curtin 
who has made this call to CARICOM to say you cannot just be issuing press releases. This is urgent enough for you to call a CARICOM summit on the Guyana-Venezuela um, dispute and to come out with a resolution to this, calling the Guyana and Venezuela to the table also, if needs be. But Venezuela has come out this morning. Well, they did it yesterday. They have literally um, lashed into into CARICOM in a sea. I don't know if you saw that that response to the CARICOM press release from Maduro's government. I mean, it is it is scathing against CARICOM. As a matter of fact, he has accused CARICOM of lying straight out. Um, so, so already we see that happening. Let me take a quick break and, and come back, um, Brother yeah. David. Let me take a quick break. In the last um, three minutes, uh, Dr. David Mohammed, um, live online as we look at the Venezuela Guyana border dispute. The Essequibo region um, is in serious um, dispute, contention. It's been going on for um, over 200 years, probably more. This is coming from way back, way back. But here we are. The referendum is underway in Venezuela today. In a minute or so, uh, Brother David, because we're, we're totally out of time, regardless yes. of the outcome of the referendum today, mm-hmm. what do you think would be the likely scenarios in terms of the, the diplomatic, the legal, the geopolitical developments that would follow this referendum on Esequibo uh, in Venezuela? Well, I think that one consequence of this for Venezuela is that they may find that afterwards, by taking this action, that they have even less friends than they had before. Venezuela has borders with Colombia, Brazil, Guyana, arguably, we can say Trinidad and Tobago, even though Mm -hmm. there's a seven-mile gulf there. But you have a country that has had neighboring countries accept their citizens by the tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. And what is so unique about that is, and I think it is very rare, that we have accepted citizens from Venezuela who are displeased with their government while we have still defended their government. Mm -hmm. You don't see that happening. You don't accept persons fleeing a country and then still turn around and defend the country that they're fleeing from, Mm -hmm. which means we have taken the side of all Venezuelans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think President Maduro has to use some wisdom in there and also take into consideration that there are multiple premises that we can look back in and make a claim for some territory. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you look at the history of Europe, then Belgium was invaded, um, Germany invaded, Russia, Poland was invaded, France is invaded, you have Ireland and Northern Ireland. Everyone could look back in history and say, you know what? We have the right to go and take another country arbitrarily without any type of consideration for mm-hmm. contemporary um, relations between nations. Yes. So it would appear that there's not much thought or not sufficient thought being put into that. Mm-hmm. And I hope that um, their advisors could shed some light on that matter. But having said that, I have heard and seen interviews with Venezuelan ambassadors who are completely ruled out any kind of military aggression mm-hmm. in the situation. Yes. All right, and I believe that I, um, we would be spared from having to endure that within mm-hmm. our beloved region. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't rule out skirmishes on the border. And this is where, um, because we're thinking of Falklands and, and, and even, well, definitely yeah. Falklands, but it doesn't rule out skirmishes on the border. This is, I think, where there is this uncertainty because there's a political element where Maduro is, is he's taken this to, to the people. Now, elections coming up in 2024, he's, if the people vote yeah. yes on all five, he's going to have to deliver something. What is he going to deliver? <laughs> Let us leave it there. Thank you so much. Yeah. And also one last thing, skirmishes with whom? Skirmishes on the border with whom? Well, with with the United States and and we see where Brazil stands in all of this. 
But definitely, but America is already there. Even though America has come out to say that they don't, they, there's no military base in in Guyana, they don't want to put a military base. But Southcom is already there. Southcom is a military base, yeah. <laughs> you know. But thank you so much, my brother, and we'll continue yes, on this conversation. So yes, and we'll see what happens um, after the referendum. We'll talk again. Yes, looking forward to it. Thank you so much and love and blessings to all in Jamaica and all the listeners in the diaspora. And to you too, my brother. Take care. Take care. All right. right. Um, Our brother David uh, Mohammed there. Uh, Wow. I say no, no, no. Don't touch a secret vote. I say no, no, no. So Guyana is saying don't touch us, Equibo. The five questions on the referendum today. One, do you agree to reject by all means in accordance with the law, the line fraudulently imposed by the 1899 Paris Arbitration Award, which seeks to deprive us of our Guyana, our Guyana Esequiba? And two, number two. All right, number two, do you support the 1966 Geneva Agreement as the only valid legal instrument to reach a practical and satisfactory solution for Venezuela and Guyana regarding the controversy over the territory of Guyana Esequibo? And number three, do you agree with Venezuela's historical position of not recognizing the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice to resolve the territorial controversy over Guyana Esequibo? And uh, next question, do you agree to oppose by all legal means Guyana's claim to unilaterally dispose of a C pending delimitation illegally and in violation of international law. And the final question, which is the one that uh, Guyana has raised serious objections to and why Guyana talks about an existential threat. Do you agree with the creation of the Guyana Esequiba State and the development of an accelerated plan for comprehensive care for the current and future population of that territory, which includes, among others, the granting of citizenship and identity card. Venezuela, in accordance with the Geneva Agreement and the international law, consequently incorporating said state on the map of Venezuelan territory. This is the existential threat. Question number five. Do you agree with the creation of a Guyana Esequiba state? and the development of an accelerated plan for comprehensive care for the current and future population of a territory, which includes, among others, the granting of citizenship and identity card. Venezuela, in accordance with the Geneva Agreement and international law, consequently incorporating said state on the map of the Venezuelan territory. The Africa Forum, this is Running African. When I go to the phone lines, uh, where my brother, Dr. Professor Tunde Biwaji, is standing by. He's live in Kenya, as we told you earlier. Good morning, Prof. Yes, good morning and good afternoon from here. Ah, How are you? I am well if you two are well. I'm so happy to make this connection with you. Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, from, from all of us here, because we did call but didn't get you on phone, but from all of us here, um, our deepest condolences on, on your loss. And, um, glad to know at least that you're in Kenya, you're on African soil and, um, hanging in there. Yes. Thank yes. you so much. Yes. Thank you. Um, mm. what are you doing in, in Kenya, Prof? <laughs> Just a quick question. Well, the- Yes, um, there is a conference by uh, Moy University African Studies Institute. Yes. Um, and they are trying to devise uh, strategies for reconfiguring African studies. So I was invited to participate in that conference. Mm. 
Uh, that was why I came. Yes. Uh, Daniel Arab Moy was one of was the second president of uh, Kenya. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the university is named after him. Yes. By my, you know, due to from conversations with um, many people, I I was able to deduce that one of the things which uh, Moy privileged during his tenure as president was education. Oh, okay. um, he, he started the second university. Uh, the first one was started during the colonial days uh, as one of the colleges of the University of London, of which University of the West Indies mm -hmm. uh, is one. The University of Ibadan mm -hmm. is one. Yeah. Uh, Makerere University is one. University of Nairobi is one. University of uh, Accra, Legon, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, is the other. Yes. Okay. Uh, after many years, uh, Daniel Arab Moy, Dr. Moy, became president and he thought that there needed to be a second university. So Moy University named after him, after he passed on, mm -hmm. uh, is that second university in mm -hmm. Kenya. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, the, other okay. thing, the other thing that I discovered in conversations with people is that he felt strongly about the education of uh, women. Mm -hmm. And during his time, he started so many secondary and high schools especially for women only, for girls only. Mm -hmm. And that has given a fillet to uh, women education in Kenya. So you can find them in all aspects of life. Yes. You know? Yes. Ah, uh, good, good, uh, good that that's happening in Kenya. Good, good that you find, I'm not sure why I'm getting a serious feedback. Are you hearing me okay, uh, Prof? Um, I'm hearing you very well, and I don't have any problem at all from here. Uh, all right, it's coming back at me, but, so, but let me let me try and figure it out. But in the meantime, um, well, good that 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 education that we're seeing that in Kenya, because there is concern um, in other um, African countries and also Caribbean countries, wherever we are, um, in, in, for women, not just women, but. Education generally, there is a situation, and and you know you're in you're in the in the system, so you you, you understand better than most that um, more more girls are accessing uh, tertiary education than boys. Um, then how does that differ, um, say, in those uh, universities you refer to, and in Kenya generally, because of the work of Arat Moy? Um. Well, the. The situation in Kenya, um, what they were aiming at was parity, uh, not not privileging one over the other. Uh, Africa being, um, in many instances, patriarchal, at times the tendency before Arab Moy, before Daniel Arab Moy, was for girls to get married as soon as they reached the age of 18. Before the age of 18, or like in Jamaica, where you have the age of uh, consent or whatever you call it, mm -hmm. and then you do the outing that is done for girls at 16, sweet 16. Here, mm -hmm. if you have any alliance with any woman before 18, it is regarded as uh, an offense. Mm -hmm. But from 18, you know, girls can decide to continue with school or if they so desire, they could marry and continue with school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the other part of it is that uh, here, uh, at least based on my, you know, little knowledge, you know, I've been in Kenya now. I think this will be about my fifth time. Yes. I see what I can regard as parity. I don't think they needed. What Moy did was to bring the girls into the school system to bring about the parity. It's not like in Jamaica where uh, boys are more or less endangered at the tertiary institution and they have to now do what I call the affirmative action, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, I mean, to encourage uh, boys to get into UWE, for example. 
There was a time when at UWE, you know, for every, uh, out of every 10, uh, girls, ladies were about six to seven. And then they had to introduce that uh, program to encourage boys to enroll. But I don't think that is the situation here. Mm-hmm. And yet, you know? and yet, and yet, and I know you're in Kenya. I know we're, obviously, we're not going to be dwelling on this a lot. But, and yet, um, his legacy, Arat Moy's legacy, I, I, I remember, you know, covering him a lot um, in the early days of this program, um, that his legacy um, is so contested, though. Yes, because, um, you know, politics in Africa um, is always, um, you know, um, uh, convoluted, if I could use that uh, term. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in many instances, um, well, you know, you said it is contested. Actually, when you look at that program that he had for girls, Mm -hmm. For you know, girl child, uh, many men were not happy yes. uh, because the kind of advantage that they would have had, we you know, was not diluted because the empowering of women uh, diluted that hold that, uh, um, if you like, call it, uh, uh, you know, leadership or superiority or advantage which men used to have because now that you have I mean you remember that Wangari Matai actually won the Nobel Prize mm-hmm. uh, you know yes. and, um, and uh, uh, Obama uh, you know during the time of um, um, uh, you know Tom Boyer mm-hmm. who was a, 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 a colleague of uh, Jomo Kenyatta Mm-hmm. You know, education was privileged. That was when they were airlifting people, of which uh, Obama's father was one of those who were so airlifted to the U.S. Mm-hmm. for graduate studies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the privileging of education by uh, Daniel Arapmoy was not particularly um, applauded by men because it it diluted their their power their mm-hmm. hold mm-hmm. over women we, uh, one, one of the things that one of the things that i'd like to do brought, yes according to the information that i got every election that uh, daniel moy contested he won because the women who voted for him <laughs> massively <laughs> I, and, and and i recall that i recall that in covering him in the in the 1990s and i covered when he was forced out of office i covered um you know all the conversations on on female genital mutilation and how he was dealing with that i covered um so much about him so so i, I, I i'm kind of very familiar with how contested his his legacy is and that he was seen as autocratic and a dictator and so on so on the one hand as you say, you know, we see this on the continent of Africa a lot. There are these policies that are on the ground that you know are favorable in some se- in some areas, and then in other areas we have um, all of these uh, issues that 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 you know put the put the pit the African leader against his own legacy, if you will. Um, it, it is it's an interesting conversation. But let me take a quick break, um, Doctor Biwaji, and I'll come right back. Every time you are linking with a condom, could a husband, could a wife, could a be a random. Do it for your best side. The time by the Ministry of Health and Wellness is... Now, 8.48, you're inside of the Africa Forum. This is Running African. We're in Kenya. We're live in Kenya because Dr. Tunde Biwaji is in Kenya. And I'm just having a conversation um, with him about what he's seeing on the ground. And it seems the um, part of the positive, if you call it that, legacy of Daniel Arat Moy is education and the extent to which women who have been accessing education because of the policies he put in place are now um, successful and uh, and prominent, if you will, um, participation, participants in society. Um, let me ask you this, um, uh, um, Professor. Have you heard uh, any any conversation with the um, the Haiti situation and and um, all of that? The, and, I know Kenya had uh, said that they would lead, if you will, the delegation that the United Nations and the U.S. asked them to of of African and Caribbean 
um, interferers, <laughs> for want of a better term, in Haiti's, um, you know, political situation. Um, but 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 th- that went to court. Uh, is there an ongoing conversation there in Kenya about it? Have you heard anything? Oh, not not to my knowledge. I I have not been in any environment where that was uh, brought up. Okay. Um, you know, the only the only thing that I observe is that um, it seems to me from, you know, I'm in Eldoret, uh, which I'm told is a, is a city of about one point something million people mm-hmm. uh, with two very big universities. There is University of Eldoret. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are other universities that are private, and then there is Daniel Arab Moy University, and then you have Polytechnic, and you have various other colleges. Mm-hmm. One thing I find is the, um, you know, what I call the kind of discipline uh, in the society in yes. terms of, um, you know, respect for other people. Yes. Respect for people on the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way people drive. Yes. Even when there are no traffic lights, you know that when you have a city of one million plus, mm-hmm. you know, that's, and there are no traffic lights, mm-hmm. on, you know, in most of mm-hmm. the roads. And in some instances, the roundabouts are very, very uh, small. Mm-hmm. And people stop. People just stop, you know, for a yes. long time to let other people pass. Mm-hmm pedestrians, and then the city itself has wonderful, you know, uh, pedestrian walkways, which was something I suggested in a conference on reimagining Kingston a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And um, I wrote my paper, you know, you know, talking about the Kingston of the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, how you have to have you have to have respect for the people. Yes, it's not only who are in vehicular movements, you know, the, or in cars and automobiles and uh, motorbikes and all that. You must accommodate pedestrians. You must accommodate cyclists. Mm-hmm. Do you and see that? Do you, you know, do you see that coming from? A wider place, because you're talking about values, you're talking about people socialize, you're talking about just how people interact with each other, like Jamaica in the 60s or so on. Is this coming from a broader place of whether it is um, just community or uh, values instilled in the society or religion? Because we see that in most um muslim countries for example where islam is where the islamic state is a kind of a gentler kinder societies do you think it's coming from a certain place that you no, see this no, i don't see uh, kenya mm-hmm. kenya is mostly christian yes islam is islam is you know marginal from my understanding you know from my, oh yes no what i meant what uh, i meant what i meant prof is what what do you think because t- take jamaica for example and i know that you know to, for you to notice that is really because you're coming out of a space where there is disregard where there's no regard for for, for each other on on the road where there's anger and and and, and this kind of a thing and i noticed the very same thing you're talking about when i went to egypt recently and wasn't and, and I, my thing was it, it probably had something to do with because it's an Islamic state. But here you're talking about a, another state on the continent of Africa where you're noticing this calmer, well, gentler most, society. Well, South Africa, South Africa also, you know, it's 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 in the leadership. Mm. Remember what I'm saying now is the is the roads. Mm-hmm. Even the small roads, they have pedestrian. Walkways. Yes. That is the small rules, whether they are paved or unpaved. Mm-hmm. You recognize that it is not only vehicles or motorbikes that are on the road. Mm-hmm. You recognize that people have a right to choose whether to walk. You can imagine if from Mona, from Papin to Three Miles, mm-hmm. there are, you know, pedestrian walkways. Mm-hmm. There are motorbike uh, ways, mm-hmm. you know, be on the two sides of the road. You widen mm-hmm. the road, yes, that is wonderful. But while you widen the road, 
you then made it impossible for, for children to walk to school, yes. you know, for people to walk to work, yes. for people to just, you know, be mm-hmm. free without mm-hmm. having to look whether they are mm-hmm. going to be knocked down, mm-hmm. you know, by a car, by a bike. Yeah. And then the whole thing and two thing that you find with so much impatience mm. that you find, you know, on our roads in Jamaica is absolutely absent. Mm-hmm. And you could move around the city day or night without mm-hmm. hearing any noise. Mm-hmm. Noise in terms of boom boxes and, you know, all those and all you, those you night know. night noise, which is really poisonous. You know, I was up, I, I was no, I was jolted out of my sleep at two twenty two. Noise in Jamaica, you know. Yes. It is day, night. You know, yes. nuisance. Yeah, it is day and night nuisance. You know, it is it's crazy. I, I've been here now. I've been here now going to three weeks, and yes. I have not had a vehicle. Passing by me, I'm making my my stomach bouncing and you know flipping. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be watching. I think you're missing Jamaica already. <laughs> <laughs> how are you? How are you going? How are you going to manage without that? <laughs> somebody, somebody passing by your yard and all your window panes are vibrating your bed I'm is telling you on the, on the I'm <laughs> I mean what kind yeah. of life is that what kind uh, of liberty I, is that uh, it's, it's, it's sinful eh? I'm telling you I'm laughing here, but I'm very tired. I was jolted out of bed this morning at 2.22 because a party went, a party started from about six in some hills and never finished until 4.40. So here I am. But uh, but it's poisonous, you know. It, it's not good for your health. And this is the thing that we are not considering. Yeah. And even when you go, when you go to a hotel, restaurant, nightclub or something, yes. the kind of music listen to there is you know I mean you can really sit you and put your, your drink on the table and yeah. follow yeah, I understand. <laughs> so, so you, you just, a lot of us are saying, you know, we should go to Kenya for holidays. So how do we get to Kenya now? Um, yeah, yeah, yes. what's, it, would, it would be a wonderful, you know, and yeah. I went to Kipchoge's, uh, yeah. stadium. Mm-hmm. You know, his house is in Eldoret. Eldoret is regarded as the city of champions. Yes. Because of out of every 10, uh, marathon runner champions. Mm-hmm. Eldoret has produced eight of them. Oh, really? So it is known as the city of champions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we went to a place in Rift, we went to a place, you know, uh, in Rift Valley, mm-hmm. you know, just to see the delight yes. of, you know. Yes. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and, just, and just to enjoy nature and yeah. just to be there and just to relax. Yes. And you get there. You don't, they don't even play any boombox. You know, you mm-hmm. can order your thing and you're calm, mm-hmm. you can drink, mm-hmm. and the drink can go down the throat without it getting there, <laughs> you know. Blown up. <laughs> yes, it's not white yeah. rum. It's not white. <laughs> Is that one point? Not to be wise. You're the best. What I'm trying to emphasize. <laughs> what I'm trying to emphasize is that yes. freedom. Yes. Liberty, mm-hmm. you know, must come with responsibility and regard for other people. Yes, I agree. You are not any less free, mm. you know, if you if you have respect yes. for the right of the other person to his or her peace. Let us be kind to each other. It's, it's you know, a practice, yes. something we have to practice. Finally, Dr. Biwaji, in just a minute, what's the route to Kenya now from, from Jamaica? How, how does one, what's, what's the process? Oh, I think it's, um, I, well, I tried to find a very cheap flight. Mm-hmm. And my total flight came to about 12 or 1300. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I flew straight to New York. Mm-hmm. And now you know that you can get New York from Kingston for about 400 or thereabout. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, another, um, 700 or something mm-hmm. from New York to Nairobi. Ah. You know, and then you're in Kenya. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. That's, it, just, that's yeah. just about 1100. Yeah, in the greater scheme of things, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty reasonable. Not that it's cheap, but in understanding what the fares are to the continent of Africa. 
Um, it's right there. Well, when you yeah. compare that with, with Kingston to London mm. at a certain time of the year, Kingston to London alone could be twelve hundred. Yeah, alone. You know? Yeah, yeah, alone. Uh huh. And you so, don't reach Kenya. That is just a distance mm-hmm. of just about eight hours. Yeah. You know. All right. So you're gonna be there have for you, him? Have you made? Have you made your trip? Have you, you know, your earpiece? Um, Trip to Nigeria has it come up? Um, and, uh, we heard it was going to happen recently, and then nothing, and then we heard again. So I'm just kind of holding on until I hear that it's really solid, um, you know. But I haven't heard okay. anything in recent times. But if you hear anything, please let us know. I'm in contact with them, so if w- once it happens, um, I'll be on it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank I you. hope I'll be in Nigeria when you are coming. Of course, so you better that be. So you can have some good, some good pounded yam and some good palm wine. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. And some good jollof rice, although that's Ghana, but it's Nigeria too. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Enjoy Kenya and we talk when you get back. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Yes. All, right. all the best. And to you too, Professor Tunde Biwaji there in Kenya. On Friday, the International Court of Justice made a ruling on the request from Guyana that the court intervene in the referendum that's currently underway. So I want to play that for you. The It's pretty short, the court's findings and the court's ruling. The sitting is open. The court meets in this public sitting to deliver its decision on the request for the indication of provisional measures submitted by the Cooperative Republic of Guyana in the case concerning the arbitral award of 3 October 1899, Guyana versus Venezuela. Gajat Hak Wolfram, who duly participated in both the deliberations and the final vote, is, for reasons made known to me, unable to take his seat on the bench today. I recall that on 28 March 2018, Guyana filed in the registry of the court an application instituting proceedings against the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela with respect to a dispute concerning the legal validity and binding effect of the award regarding the boundary between the colony of British Guyana and the United States of Venezuela on 3 October 1899, to which I shall refer as the 1899 award or the award. In its judgment of 18 December 2020, to which I shall refer as the 2020 judgment, the court found that it has jurisdiction to entertain the application filed by Guyana insofar as it concerns the validity of the 1899 award and the related question of the definitive settlement of the land boundary dispute between Guyana and Venezuela. The court also found that it did not have jurisdiction to entertain the claims of Guyana arising from events that occurred after the signature of the agreement to resolve the controversy between Venezuela and the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland over the frontier between Venezuela and British Guyana, signed at Geneva on 17 February 1966, to which I shall refer as the Geneva Agreement. I further recall that in its judgment of 6 April 2023, to which I shall refer as the 2023 Judgment, The court rejected Venezuela's preliminary objection concerning the exercise of the court's jurisdiction and found that it could adjudicate upon the merits of Guyana's claims, insofar as they fall within the scope of the court's jurisdiction as defined in the operative clause of the 2020 judgment. I finally recall that on 30 October 2023, Guyana filed a request for the indication of provisional measures referring to Article 41 of the statute and Articles 73 and 74 of the Rules of Court. In its request, Guyana states that on 23 October 2023, the government of Venezuela, through its National Electoral Council, published a list of five questions that it plans to put before the Venezuelan people in a consultative referendum on 3 December 2023. According to the applicant, the purpose of the questions is, I quote, to obtain responses that would support Venezuela's decision to abandon these proceedings and to resort instead to unilateral measures to resolve the controversy with Guyana by formally annexing and integrating into Venezuela all of the territory at issue in these proceedings, which comprises more than two-thirds of Guyana. End of quotation. 
In accordance with the usual practice, I shall not read the introductory paragraphs of the order, which set out the procedural history of the case. I shall also omit or summarize some other paragraphs. I shall accordingly begin the reading of the order at paragraph 13. The full text of the order will, of course, be available at the close of the sitting. The court begins by recalling that it already set out in its two judgments the general background and context of the dispute between Guyana and Venezuela, which dates back to a series of events that took place during the second half of the 19th century when Guyana was still a British colony known as British Guyana. At that time, the United Kingdom and Venezuela both claimed the territory located between the mouth of the Essequibo River on the east and the Orinoco River to the west. In 1897, an arbitral tribunal was established to settle the boundary between British Guyana and Venezuela. In its 1899 award, the arbitral tribunal granted the entire mouth of the Orinoco River and the land on either side to Venezuela. It granted to the United Kingdom, in respect of British Guyana, the land to the east extending to the Essequibo River. Between November 1990 and June 1904, a joint Anglo-Venezuelan commission demarcated the boundary established by the 1899 award. On 10 January 1905, after the boundary had been demarcated, the British and Venezuelan commissioners produced an official boundary map and signed an agreement accepting inter alia the coordinates of the points listed were correct. On 14 February 1962, Venezuela informed the Secretary General of the United Nations that it considered there to be a dispute between itself and the United Kingdom concerning the demarcation of the frontier between Venezuela and British Guyana. The government of the United Kingdom, for its part, rejected that contention, asserting that the question had been finally settled by the 1899 award. After various attempts to resolve the matter failed, the representatives of the United Kingdom, Venezuela, and British Guyana signed the Geneva Agreement on 17 February 1966. On 26 May 1966, Guyana, having obtained independence, became a party to that agreement. Attempts were made in the ensuing decades to resolve the dispute through different means of settlement envisaged in the Geneva Agreement, all of which failed leading the Secretary General of the United Nations in January 2018 under the Geneva Agreement to choose the court as the means to resolve the dispute. Having recalled this general background, the court then turns to the requirements for the indication of provisional measures. With respect to the question of jurisdiction, the court observes that it may indicate provisional measures only if the provisions relied on by the applicant appear at least prima facie to afford a basis jurisdiction could be founded. In the present case, the court has already found in its 2020 judgment as jurisdiction to entertain the application filed by Guyana on 29 March 2018, insofar as it concerns the validity of the 1899 award and the related question of the definitive settlement of the land boundary dispute between Guyana and Venezuela. The court further recalls that in its 2023 judgment, it found that it could adjudicate upon the merits of the claims of Guyana insofar as they fell within the scope of the operative clause of the 2020 judgment. The court then proceeds to consider the other requirements for the indication of provisional measures. The court recalls that its powers under our statute to indicate provisional measures has as its object the preservation of the respective rights claimed by the parties in a case, pending its decision on the merits thereof. It follows that the court must be concerned to preserve by such measures the rights which may subsequently be adjudged by it to belong to either party. Therefore, the court may ascertain this power only if it is satisfied that the rights ascertained by a party requesting provisional measures are at least plausible. At this stage of the proceedings, however, the court is not called upon to determine definitively Whether the rights which Guyana seeks to protect exist, it need only decide whether the rights claimed by Guyana on the merits and for which it is seeking protection are plausible. Moreover, a link must exist between the rights whose protection is sought and the provisional measures being requested. The court observes that Guyana contends 
that it seeks the preservation and protection of its right to the territory awarded to it by the 1899 award, pending the court's determination of the validity of that award and to the integrity of its territory, or alternatively, its right to the settlement by the court of the land boundary between Guyana and Venezuela. The court recalls its finding in the 2020 judgment that a land boundary dispute exists between the parties. It further observes that the territory which forms the object of that dispute was awarded to British Guyana in the 1899 award. In light of the foregoing, the court considers that Guyana's right to sovereignty over the territory in question is plausible. The court then turns to a requirement of a link between the rights claimed by Guyana that the court has found to be plausible and the provisional measures requested. The court observes that one of the provisional measures requested by Guyana seeks to ensure that Venezuela does not, I quote, take any actions that are intended to prepare or allow for the exercise of sovereignty or de facto control over any territory that was awarded to British Guyana in the 1899 award, end of quotation. The court considers that this measure is aimed at protecting Guyana's right, which the court has found plausible. The court concludes, therefore, that a link exists between the rights claimed by Guyana that the court has found to be plausible and the aforementioned requested provisional measure. The court next notes that, pursuant to Article 41 of its statute, it has the power to indicate provisional measures when irreparable prejudice could be caused to the rights which are subject of judicial proceedings or when the alleged disregard of such rights may entail irreparable consequences. However, the power of the court to indicate provisional measures will be exercised only if there is urgency, in the sense that there is a real and imminent risk that irreparable prejudice will be caused to the rights claimed before the court gives its final decision. The condition of urgency is met when the acts susceptible of causing irreparable prejudice can occur at any moment before the court makes a final decision in the case. The court must therefore consider whether such risk exists at this stage of the proceedings. The court is not called upon for the purposes of its decision on the request for indication of provisional measures to reach a decision on either party's position on the merits, but to determine whether the circumstances require the indication of provisional measures or the protection of the rights found to be plausible. It cannot at this stage make definitive findings of fact and the right of each party to submit arguments in respect of the merits remains unaffected by the court's decision on the request for the indication of provisional measures. Having previously determined that Guyana's rights to sovereignty over the territory awarded to British Guyana by the 1899 award is plausible, and that there is a link between this right and one of the provisional measures requested, the court turns next to the question whether irreparable prejudice could be caused to this right and whether there is urgency in the sense that there is a real and imminent risk that irreparable prejudice will be caused to this right before the court gives its final decision. The court recalls that the fifth question of the referendum refers explicitly to the creation of the Guyana Essequibo State as well as an accelerated and comprehensive plan to be developed for the granting of Venezuelan citizenship and identity cards to the population of that territory, consequently incorporating the Guyana Essequiba state into the map of Venezuelan territory. The court further observes that Venezuela's Supreme Tribunal of Justice has confirmed the constitutionality of the questions to be posed in the referendum. The court notes that Venezuela stated during the oral proceedings that it will not turn its back on what the people decide in the referendum of 3 December 2023. On 24 October 2023, the president of Venezuela, Mr. Nicolas Maduro Moros, publicly stated that the referendum would give Venezuelans for the first time the means to take a collective decision as a country. Other official statements suggest that Venezuela is taking steps with a view towards acquiring control over and administering the territory in dispute. For instance, on 6 November 2023, the Minister of Defense of Venezuela, General Vladimir Padrino Lopez, made an appeal to go to combat with reference to the territory in question. Furthermore, Venezuelan military officials announced that Venezuela is taking concrete measures 
to build an airstrip to serve as, I quote, logistical support point for the integral development of the Essequibo, end of quote. The court considers that in light of the strong tension that currently characterizes the relations between the parties, the aforementioned circumstances present a serious risk of Venezuela acquiring and exercising control and administration of the territory in dispute in the present case. It therefore concludes that there is a risk of irreparable prejudice to the right claimed by Guyana in the present proceedings that the court has found plausible. The court further considers that Venezuela's expressed readiness to take action with regard to the territory in dispute in these proceedings at any moment following the referendum scheduled for 3 December 2023 demonstrates that there is urgency in the sense that there is a real and imminent risk of irreparable prejudice to Guyana's plausible right before the court gives its final decision. The court concludes from all of the aforementioned considerations that the conditions for the indication of provisional measures are met. It is therefore necessary, pending its final decision, for the court to indicate certain measures in order to protect the plausible right claimed by Guyana as identified by the court. The court recalls that it has the power under its statute when a request for provisional measures has been made to indicate measures that are in whole or in part other than those requested. In the present case, having considered the terms of the provisional measures requested by Guyana and the circumstances of the case, the court finds that the measures to be indicated need not be identical to those requested. The court observes that the situation that currently prevails in the territory in dispute is that Guyana administers and exercises control over that area. The court considers that Pending the final decision in the case, Venezuela must refrain from taking any action which would modify that situation. The court emphasizes that the question of the validity of the 1899 award and the related question of the definitive settlement of the land boundary dispute between Guyana and Venezuela are matters for the court to decide at the merit stage. The court recalls that Guyana has requested it to indicate measures aimed at ensuring the non-aggravation of the dispute with Venezuela. When indicating provisional measures for the purpose of preserving specific rights, the court may also indicate provisional measures with a view to preventing the aggravation or extension of a dispute when it considers that the circumstances so require. In the current case, having considered all the circumstances, in addition to the specific measure that it has decided to take, the court deems it necessary to indicate an additional measure directed at both parties and aimed at ensuring the non-aggravation of the dispute between them. The court recalls that its orders indicating provisional measures under Article 41 of the statute have binding effect and thus create international legal obligations for any party to whom the provisional measures are addressed. I shall now read out the operative part of the order. For these reasons, the court indicates the following provisional measures. One, unanimously, pending a final decision in the case, the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela shall refrain from taking any action which would modify the situation that currently prevails in the territory in dispute, whereby the Cooperative Republic of Guyana administers and exercises control over that area. Two, unanimously, both parties shall refrain from any action which might aggravate or extend the dispute before the court or make it more difficult to resolve. I shall now call upon the registrar to read the operative paragraph part of the order in French. All right. So we would like to see the International Court of Justice doing a very similar thing on Israel and Palestine, which is why I like number one, two, three, four, number three, on the five questions of referendum that Venezuela has. Do you agree with Venezuela's historical position of not recognizing the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice to resolve the territorial controversy over Guyana Essequibo? You know, we've been taking note of Jamaica's treatment of um, Haitians coming into Jamaica and you know, it's an interesting thing. The government of Jamaica, the 
Andrew Holness led administration has taken an interesting stance on Haiti, an interesting stance on Israel, Palestine. The, this, they are doing something about us without us. The question I need to ask and have answered is, is it a fact that majority of us Jamaicans would prefer or would want the Prime Minister, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and those who are in Parliament to deport Haitian refugees as soon as they land on, on the island? Is it a fact that that is what we want? Are they doing this in our name? Is it a fact that we want these very same people on our behalf to support Israel 100% over Palestine and the babies who are being killed, the genocide and the ethnic cleansing? Is it a fact that we want the leaders, those who we pay, those who we pay their salaries, is it a fact that we want them to be supportive of Israel 100% and to come out and say it and then tongue-in-cheek to say you're not speaking on behalf of the administration in the way that we saw Mr. Hill doing? Is, is, is it a fact that that is what we want? I, 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 I'm, I'm flabbergasted. I, no, at no, in no universe at all can I even begin to understand that thinking from the current administration. I can understand the extent to which you are controlled by the United States, but that has been the case for years and years and years and years. And yet we have managed over time to still stand on the right side of history many, many times. When did we get to this place that you in our name would deport Haitian refugees, would support Israel in their genocide in, in Palestine? And so much more. Last Wednesday, we saw the senior advisor and strategist in the Ministry of Tourism, Delana Seavright, announcing that resulting from the increased numbers of new as well as non-stop flights into Jamaica, he was saying that it was projected to bring the visitors tally to 4 million by year's end. <laughs> and um, talk about an income of 4.1 billion US dollars for the same period. Well, not a bene. Not a bene. We must make a distinction between income to Jamaica and income to Jamaicans. Because as I was saying before, Jamaica and Jamaicans are two different things. And we have to begin to make that distinction. So when them said Jamaica themselves, they're not talk about. Right? So we have to ask now where we fall in all of that. How are we identified in them policies and when them are referred to us, what do they call us? Squatters? Lawbreakers? What them call we? Hooligans? Less than human? Them have all kinds of names for us, but definitely when them said Jamaica is not me and you them talking about. We know that. And the question is how many Jamaicans Aside from those directly employed in the industry or affiliated with the industry, how many Jamaicans stand to benefit from this billion dollar project? We're seeing that anomaly, you know, niche affluence. Them rich and we poor. Niche affluence. Niche affluence amid widespread poverty. That is the definition of prosperity. Niche aff affluence amid widespread poverty. That is the definition of prosperity in Jamaica, by the way. We can't get over Jamaica's attitude to the Haitians, you know. I know I say it and I come back to it and so on, but I really just cannot get over it. It, 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 it boggles the mind. It's inhumane the way you're treating 
the 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 um the the Haitians are brothers and sisters from Haiti who are refugees. You know, um when when do refugees who come into Haiti into Jamaica get air conditioned buses? What do you have to look like? We see the same thing happening in the Dominican Republic. Haitians are treated the very same way. We see our Jamaica and, and the Dominican Republic tight. But this parraging attitude, man, that, that, that the Andrew Holness led administration has against a hit. We need some loud voices from the... <sighs> Did you finally get Jerry? <laughs> 9.33. All right, so... I was over here at living through things and I hear that um we finally have Jerry on the line but um okay so what let me see if we can get him I, we, I'll I'll take him I'll take him um we're watching you know we're watching the the, the Israel we're watching our Jamaica treating Palestine we're watching you know but karma is a thing karma is a thing you know we're watching the international organizations we're watching every by the way by the way talking about that I talk about UNICEF last week and somebody took me on seriously, but I tell you, I, I'm, 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 I stand by what I said, you know, because I said UNICEF, United Nations, all of them, I, International Court of Justice, it don't matter what you call yourself, all of you, international law, international organizations, you have made yourself null and void because of your, because of what is ongoing, not just in Israel and Palestine, but foregrounded because of what is really that genocide and ethnic cleansing that is happening on your watch. You have made yourself null and void. I want you to go and look up the, the person who is the um, director of, uh, of, the, of UNICEF. And I want you also to go and see who she's married to. Uh, she's married to the, the person who is the head of BlackRock. No, I don't have no whole of a time to talk about BlackRock this morning. But if the director of UNICEF is married to the head of BlackRock, then that explains why children. Anyway, um, can I go to Jerry? Jerry, you there? <laughs> you know, um, morning, morning, Jerry. Morning again. Jerry Small on the phone. Morning, lines. Doing, Boy, Jerry, my day, I get a little bit of angry, but me come right back now that me hear your voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, tell you, I don't get angry more time unless. <laughs> I, I am here, as you know, in Tanzania, yes. with my hostess, who was introducing to our most interesting person. Yes. Um, this is Betty Delphus Ingleton, mm -hmm. and his name is Walter, a contemporary of our Walter Rodney, born the same year, 1942. Uh -huh. Walter, hello. Say hello to Ariel. Hello, hello. hi, hi. Oh, hi. Greetings, greetings, yeah. Walter. Greetings, how are you doing? Very well, thank you, and you. I am Lovely well. Th ah, I'm well, thank you. Good to hear you also. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> so, Jerry, tell me a yes, little bit. I'm, I'm having a very, we're having a very wonderful time listening to uh, Jerry. You know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back to your car. Yeah. Yes. Tell Just because I say interesting hearing from him, he says it, now is the end of it, right? Ah, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. We're going to hear more from you, but Jerry, let, let tell me uh, a little bit about him, your guest. Yeah, he's a contemporary Walter Rodney, same age, same year, born to him. He pub he published. All right, he he. Which book did you publish? How Europe underdeveloped Africa. He published how, how Europe underdeveloped Africa. Oh, wow! What yeah. a, yes, what yeah. an achievement! Yeah. Ah, so 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 you were you were part you were part of that phenomenal uh, seminal work. Yes, yes, I published it. Uh, wow. Thank you so much for that because we read that, you know, that becomes, that is part of our, bi our, our biblical kind of thing. We, we have that as a Bible, yeah, yeah. as a Bible. Um, yeah. so, so tell us about that relationship with yourself and, and, and Walter Rodney. Who? Yeah, tell us about the relationship with yourself and Walter Rodney. You, you, you met him, um, on his first tenure in Africa. Didn't yeah, you? yeah, yeah. Walter Rodney, yes. I mean, I, I, I thought you said maybe the. No, no. What, what happened is that Walter has been a diplomat. No. Uh, because... Hold on one minute, please. Okay. Walter has been a diplomat in mm -hmm. Addis Ababa from about 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And when he returned, when he returned to Tanzania in time to meet Walter Rodney, what is your last name, Walter? 
Ogoya. How you spell it? Ogoya. B G O Y A. Yes. Mm-hmm. And he's a, he's a publisher, but he was a, he was in a diplomatic service for years before that. At that mm-hmm. time, yes. And I left and joined the the for, I mean the publishing house, 1972. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the book came out 1973, at the beginning, you know. But we we did that book with uh, 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 what's her name in London. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, uh, what's her name? All right. Mm. It, it, will, it will come. It will come. Video. Yes. yes. Just, the, the Huntley, Jessica. Jessica Huntley. Okay. Okay. Jessica Huntley. Yeah, Jessica Huntley from London. Bogle, 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 Bogle over to your production. Bogle, 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 yeah. mm-hmm. it together. It was mm-hmm. a co-publication between them and us, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and, 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 and with, with, Walter, I, I want you to tell me a little bit about Walter Rodney, what you thought of him uh, in those early days. Oh, I mean, he was a very beautiful person, a great brother, very comrade, and very articulate, very sharp, mm. Uh, mm. hardworking, extremely hardworking, and uh, with a fantastic discipline, you know, of work, because uh, he was at the university and... Uh, Sometimes we would go to his house and we would all be, you know, in the living room and he would be working in the, in his office, mm-hmm. in his room mm-hmm. and he wouldn't come out for hours. And, uh, <laughs> he would not come out for hours. Yes, he would be I drinking heard. and carrying on and he would be working. So mm-hmm. that's tremendous discipline, but yeah. he also, you know, really, uh, loved to dance very mm-hmm. much. I think at the time the, the, the dance was the ska. <laughs> <And> yeah. it, <laughs> was, it was, it was great dancing with the ska and uh, yeah. a fantastic brother. And also, by the way, he used to every Sunday play cricket at, uh, at, uh, the Jim Kana club, which many of us thought were both a cricket and the Jim Kana club was a very big petty bourgeois, yeah, very bourgeois white people. institution. And how, and and how, did, how did Water Road fit in there? Mm-hmm. Little mm-hmm. knowing that, of course, in Jamaica, cricket is sort of like a people's... And Guyana, yeah. Guyana, people's yes. sport. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, you know, but he became very close friend and... He uh, was a, a, a close friend of Neri too. Yeah, mm. yeah. And, How do you uh, pronounce Neri Yeah, Neri. Yeah. And uh, I still am in touch with Patricia and, you know, Rodney and the children and so on. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. It was um, long lasting friendship mm-hmm. and comradeship. So yeah. Really, yeah. We, we, we were, we were, we were just talking earlier about, um, Pan Africanism and what it means, um, in this time as a scholar publisher yourself. Um, your own, mm. your own take on, on, on where we are with that. Is, is it, is it, is it, has it become almost irrelevant? On the contrary, it has become irrelevant. It's mm-hmm. become even more re- relevant than ever before. Mm-hmm. I think what's happening is that we we are so disjointed. I mean, so, I mean, uh, there isn't unfortunately a leadership like you had during the Nkrumah time or during the Rarest time. We don't have a very strong leadership on a, on an African continental scale to drive the process. But but on the other hand, there is a, the movement is strong in different places. I mean, mm-hmm. there is a global Pan African movement in North America, for example, that I'm, I'm aware of. Barbados, to surprise. Barbados, of course, and I was lucky to be, to, to visit, uh, last mm-hmm. year. And, mm-hmm. uh, so there are these movements, but I think there is more, move more in the, in the Caribbean, particularly around the, uh, you know, uh, Restitution, not restitution, um, uh, re, not repatriation, no. Mm. Reparation. Reparation, mm. around reparation movement. It's very strong in the Caribbean. Yes. Not so strong on the continent. And mm. that, uh, in fact, I, I personally, I think that the leadership of this movement is now in the Caribbean mm. and, uh, mm. and more, more than anywhere else because I don't mm. even see it in North America mm-hmm. with such a, uh, grassroots uh, scale as it is in the Caribbean. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. so uh, but um, I think also that uh, unfortunately we don't have that leadership of the content right now except incidentally in South Africa with this young radical fellow, mm-hmm, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, Malema, Julius Malema. Malema. Who is, mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. who is talking very much about, you know, mm-hmm. giving Pan-Africanism a very uh, co- co- contemporary 
uh, perspective and particularly mm-hmm. the sense of movement of African people on the continent and mm-hmm. so on. Mm-hmm. Now, some countries, uh, Rwanda, uh, Kenya, and uh, I believe, I think, I don't know if it's Burkina Faso or some other country recently, mm-hmm. where they've declared that, you know, black people uh, from anywhere can visit without visa. Yes, uh, yes. I think that's very good. Uh, uh, development. Mm-hmm. Yes, sorry, one minute. And I was Betty, this, this is Betty Depot, um, this was in England, the Council for Jamaica was telling us earlier. Mm-hmm. For years in Uganda, it was declared a criminal uh, offense to disparage or to curse non citizens of Uganda who are black as, as, as outsiders. What? Yeah. They are prohibited from referring to any black people from anywhere where in the world as foreigners mm-hmm. in Uganda. Yes. Thousand US dollar fine. Yes. And I, of course, my head was open there. Well, let, 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 we're not hearing better too well. Can, can, can we? Can we have? Mm-hmm. Hi. 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 Well, well, how are you doing? Welcome. Yes. Welcome. Yes. Well, thanks. Mm-hmm. Well, well, thanks. I just wanted to um, what was just speaking of Julius Lever mm-hmm. and how. Oh, he has no, um, he's keeping the, the, the movement of the Pan African movement alive. And he mm-hmm. just spoke at the opening of the, the first Pan African Institute in South Africa. There is mm-hmm. now a university, Pan Africa University in South yes, Africa. Yes, yes. Yes. Right. I'm but sure you're aware of Of that. course. And, and the thing about it, the concern is, and, and we are having these conversations among ourselves as, as, as Pan-Africans um, in this part of the world as to, you know, whether or not we need to, uh, uh, and, and um, which I just heard Walter reference it, this contemporary Pan-Africanism is what does it look like? Um, do we need a more cohesive kind of a, um, a, a definition of what it is? Because it, it seems so splintered. In, in so many different, you know, areas that sometimes you're not even sure where your foothold is. And many of us now are saying we are African centered, moving away from what Pan Africanism is beginning to look like. You know, and this is why I, I, I pose a question is that is, do we have a crisis in, in, in even how we, what we are referring to as Pan Africanism? Yeah, one thing. Well, I, I mean, you know, there are so many possibilities of such a huge idea. It's just a- the definition of an elephant, everybody touching one side of the elephant and singing this <laughs> entire elephant. Yeah. Yes. I mean, Pan Africanism is such a great idea. It embraces all people on the African continent. It embraces not just the unity of, of ex- historical experience, of mm-hmm. cultural experience, you know, economic, economic, and the share, sharing of the and should the military yeah, yeah but but also speak to the future of of black people and mm-hmm. uh, you know here uh, outside the continent and everywhere because fundamentally the problems that they face still are the same you know yes yes whether it is South America in Brazil yes. in Argentina in Mexico mm-hmm. uh, in Europe, in North America, the problems are still the same, mm-hmm. and so just as the struggle to realize these things uh, 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 is, uh, it has to be mm-hmm. united. Yeah. So, what is it the next step? What, should should Pan Africanism answer? Should, should Pan Africanism answer the question of? So, so we had um, during the His Imperial Majesty or Sajifo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, Amilcar Cabral, and them, we were talking independence then, um, you know, uh, and and uh, post-colonialism and getting out of colonialism. Uh, uh, those were some of the issues we were dealing with. We still, um, I think, have to deal with the the colonial project. But but what is an, what is the next? Next um, step for Pan Africanism in terms of what 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 are we hoping to achieve and what should we be looking at now that most most of these countries have received so called independence? Yeah, but, but, but you just said they received so-called independence. How do we realize this? Realize it. Realize. It. Realize it. Make it real. Make it real. Yeah. I think, for instance, neoliberalism is definitely contrary to Pan Africanism. Yes. Because neoliberalism defines 
it's a, it's, it's a centered around extreme individualism, yes. private accumulation of wealth, mm-hmm. disregard for the common good, mm-hmm. and disregard for autonomy. Yes. And, mm-hmm. you know, yes. and, and, and these, these are competing against the values of African people as mm-hmm. they exemplified in the Ubuntu philosophy. For yes, instance. yes. You know. Yes, and, and so, so the the the, po- the point here, mm-hmm. in my view, is how do we continue to pass on these values mm-hmm. to to struggle for these values among the young people, teach these values, mm-hmm. institutionalize them wherever we can, mm-hmm. and and therefore make the uh, uh, Pan African struggle a living struggle, yes. not just some kind of academic. Activity, yes, yes. but reflected in the way we live, in the way we work. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. these are these are things that mm-hmm. are important to to, to, mm-hmm. to because as essentially these values still exist among every black people, no matter where they are. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, um, and Cabo, you you would appreciate how much when the ladies, you yourself, when the, when the ladies um get involved with something, there is no stopping it. Yes. And Betty herself is, is such a focal point. Uh, although she might not want me to go in, in, in the whole understanding <laughs> of these things. Yes. Yeah. I know. And I, and I, dumb, I, I really appreciate, <laughs> and I really appreciate the work that she's doing in Tanzania. I know we communicated one time because I was thinking of going there during COVID, you know, Betty. I don't know, know if you remember my emails, but, um, we just kind of, so. yes, Absolutely. we were thinking of coming in for, but, but, yeah, but, 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 but go but ahead. Your question. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I want to go back to the point Walter just made. Yes. That, um, and the question should be asked, did we really achieve independence? Yes. Don't you think that that struggle is still alive? On exactly. And this total is... independence, especially when you look at what's happening in Jamaica. Mm-hmm. So it's not, so I don't, I don't think we need to ask the question, what is it we're doing after mm-hmm. independence? Mm-hmm. And no, and this is the point, and this is why I said so called, and this is the dynamic. Yes. Of Pan African movement. Because right. the struggle is still real. I agree. And it's still, it is still continuing. I agree. And what mm-hmm. we are trying to do, if enlightened, what we are, we, we are just, we just mm-hmm. had a conversation that people of our generation who were literally soldiers on the ground, mm-hmm. who literally was at the forefront mm-hmm. of educating and enlightening, you know, and giving enlightenment mm-hmm. to a generation. Or, mm-hmm. or, or, you know, people of our generation. Um, mm-hmm. it is now also our responsibility yes. to give it to the generation that is coming up. That's and critical. that's the contribution that will make yeah. because it might not be realized in our lifetime. That's a mistake. A lot mm-hmm. of people think that, hey, mm-hmm. it has to be war horrid and it has mm-hmm. to happen in mm-hmm. our lifetime. Mm-hmm. No, it will not most likely happen in your lifetime. Mm-hmm. Your responsibility is to make a constant contribution. Exactly. Yeah? Exactly. exactly. Make a yeah. constant contribution. Yeah. So, and through, through dialogue, com- communication, and especially now when we know that we have, we are, we are, you know, life is dynamic, so we have so many issues now, global mm-hmm. issues, mm-hmm. that's impacting this movement yeah. as in as you are aware mm-hmm. what's happening now in the cop 20 the cop 28 um mm-hmm. conference in dubai the idea that um the the world is, the the climate is is we are 1.5 degrees away from states like our countries in the south like jamaica barbados and so and so being totally wiped out or submerged by the way and, but, but we, are, we, are, we have all gone but our leaders our leaders from africa and the african diaspora have all gone there with their begging bowls and that again speaks to the they question are, that are, i'm putting no no wait wait a minute what they are I'm not our leaders. Well, let me finish let me just try and, let me just say this that where, what, when you talk about pan Africa, where the pan African movement ought to be now, I think crucial it is, and first and foremost, we need to realize how important it is for South South nations and their, and, and nations of the Caribbean to now align themselves with Africa. Because what is up on us, yes. it, what is up on us now, uh, the possibility of a complete wiping out Agreed. of our yes. habitat. Agreed. 
Agreed. You see? Uh, so, so, yeah. so if you want to, what is crucial, what is crucial mm-hmm. now for the Pan-African mm-hmm. movement is to identify how serious it is yes. that association and alignments must take place. May I say I this? totally may I agree. Say yes, go ahead, Jerry. Yes. May I, may, may I say this, Cabo? Mm-hmm. Um, it brings me around to Venezuela wanting to eat up one of the, the rich African, black African, um, Afro-Asian states, Guyana. Yes. This is what we were discussing this morning. And, uh, you know, uh, it, obviously a, a very complex issue because of the historical context. But um, like yourself, I, I am firmly on the side of Guyana in all of this. Um, at the same time, we find ourselves um, in face, front and face uh, to with the United States and ExxonMobil and, and all of these conglomerates who are also have planted themselves with the South, South, South Command, uh, Southcom, uh, yeah. you know, like Africom. In, in now in Guyana, uh, because they are they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're f- fitting now to go to go fight against Venezuela. So we we also have that. Jerry, there's also another thing that Walter said, you know, that um, and to and to and to bring it to the point that um, Betty's making, which is that so so one of the crises I think for Pan Africanism is a neoliberal project because so many of, of of our people have bought into the neoliberal project and 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 yeah. we heard Walter just said. Yes. Yes. No, I was uh, actually, I'm, I'm very glad this point is raised up because we've been worrying a lot about this uh, information we hear about Venezuela trying to attack uh, Guyana. Yes. I didn't, I didn't realize though, we, we, a point we just made that Guyana is being used, you know, yes. as a launch pad for attack on Venezuela. Now that complicates the matter. Completely. It does. But on the other yeah. hand, I think what we need to work is then work on Venezuela and yes. work on Guyana as well. Yes. That Guyana should not put itself in a, in a, in a place to serve the interests of imperialism exactly. against uh, against uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. the brothers in Venezuela. Yeah. And at on, the same the time, and at the same time, that Venezuela must understand, you know, and not hurry up to. To launch some kind of attack. Yeah, yeah. they have a referendum going on today with five questions. It's an, the fifth question, of course, an exis- existential threat to Guyana, so that it is serious. We're not taking it um, lightly around here. But at the same time, what does that mean for the region? The, the implications for the region not looking so good at all, because right. here we have another proxy situation, because this is what it's, it seems to be leading up to. Um, it seems, as we see in Yemen, that proxy war that's going on in Yemen, they're about to move it into the Caribbean. This and, and, the, and Latin in America, and this is why this is such a, a critical moment for us. In the, Betty just pointed out that our 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 one of our things that we our mandate is really to get together to understand that this is our time to work together more than any other time on all of these climate change and all of the other issues, including these threats yeah. that are coming into our water. But there's also the, there's also this big oil thing going on in Guyana. Yes. Yes, you know, Exxon Mobil. Yes. And then, yes. then, so there's a lot of oil there. So uh, yes. Western oil corporations are right there. And of course, they want to, they probably be trying to destabilize both Guyana. Yes. That's Boy. advantage. Boy. Yes, 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 of course, yes. Guyana is, yeah. if, yes. If, if, if Guyana is involved is in it? trying to save itself, I guess, that, then they can obviously get conditions. Put in conditions that they want. All those side, all those side, all all of those side issues. They are attempting to make it mainstream to actually pull people's attention away from the main issue. That's right. Like for example, what is happening in 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 in, uh, in Gaza, yeah. where the Israelis and the Palestinians. Let me. I would like the world to believe that it's a war still between the Jews and the, the Palestinians. It is not. Never was. It is not. That's the smoke screen. It mm. really is about his quest for global economic power yes, through the building of a new canal. A canal and, 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 and a pipeline. And a pipeline. Through Gaza. Yes. And what it is really about is literally, to, in his mind, clearing the squatters from his land. Which he has but said, and I heard... Using this whole, this and and I heard, I heard of, Kamala... Of, I heard Kamala Harris saying yesterday at COP that um, America does not agree with that, which means that it is very much out in the open on the table and has already been raised to America. And this is why she's saying on a public stage that they yeah, but, will never but agree course. with it. But 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 no, because America don't want Israel to be to be competing with them at this crumbling stage of their existence to be the, um, 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 an emerging superpower. 
Yeah. It what, is not to their benefit. Cabo, Cabo. Yes, Jerry. Yeah. You remember, sir, for over six months, I've been referring to Israel as the 51st state of America. Yes. And then last week, I heard a, a Jewish um, <laughs> commentator saying the same thing. That's yes, I heard. I heard. The problem with Israel yes. now is they're going rogue. Yeah. And that's why Kamala and everyone is saying that they're going rogue. Yes, they and are. And what it is, is Netanyahu wants to be yes. the, 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 new, the, the new Putin. Yes, yeah, yes. the new Putin and he, the new Ping, because he wants to position Israel now world as, a, as a world power, world and world. he knows that he can do that by building this canal. Yes, yes. Against America. He, has yeah. against he, America. he has a plan to be independent of America. And that's absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. To be a power for America to yeah. reckon with. Um, yeah. and, and knowing the broker, that, the broker. Yeah. knowing that, yes. knowing that, yes. right? Yeah. Who controls the narrative in America? That's it. The Zionist it's Jews. Yeah, morning, yeah, the Zionist Jews. Is there, it, it, precisely. Yes. It is there. I am so I'm sorry that I'm completely out it's of time. <laughs> Betty and <laughs> Jerry and yes. um, Walter. Um, this is this. Uh, 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 listen, I'm I'm enjoying this conversation. I'm so sorry that we're out of time. I really would like to continue this conversation because um, thank these. Thank are, you so much. Love this yeah, talk. Love this talk. Yeah. Yeah. Thank it's you. Strong. I, I will be. I will be here for three more Sundays. Right. <laughs> So, so I'll be linking with you for those three more Sundays. As we say in Tanzania, in Swahili, Asante sana dadoango. Karibu tena. Look at that now, Asante sana. Hey, well on, Bukabu, Bukabu. You know what I found out? What is the pet name for for Tanzania? What? Bongo. <laughs> direct translation to Swahili means brain. B- so means in Tanzania, Tanzania in the same way Jamaica is called the rock. Uh-huh. Tanzania is bongo. Uh, Meaning this is where you have to. Use, this is the land where you must use your brain. Oh, so oh bongo goodness. is the Swahili word for brain. Well, the, uh, <laughs> Joey, so this is just tra- this is just straight showing off. Has been brain Jerry for all his life and yep. not know it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It is fitting. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Walter. And we link next week. All right. All right. Live in Tanzania, there, uh, Walter, Jerry, Betty. This is what we're saying goodbye for today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining. We're watching the referendum in Venezuela. The big A is in. Thanks to everyone who, um, listened. Thanks to my guest, Dr. Um, Godfrey Vincent and also to Jerry and the team there and David Mohammed and to you who are, who have listened, tuned in and participated in the program today. 10 o'clock and we're making the way now for the Big A inside of the Sunday Sunshine. Morning, Big A. How are you doing? Are you voting today? Independence Venezuela referendum. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> right, we have anything to talk about? Uh, uh, not really. Okay. Okay, great.